good morning and welcome to uh, our summer meeting and uh, work session. Uh, at this point in time, on behalf of the High School Athletic Association and its staff, we welcome those that are viewing us uh, through a Zoom meeting. Uh, hopefully, we'll get through this pretty quickly and easily. Uh, at this point in time, if there's no other questions in the room, or uh, we'll turn it over to President-elect Miller for our work session. All right. Our first item is 2.1, status of normally scheduled event for 2020-2021. Okay, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Miller, in front of you, you've got a, a list of the schedule in draft based on the corresponding dates. And obviously our discussions today will uh, look at possible revisions and or uh, uh, other amendments. Uh, the biggest in document we would point to is on our website and it's called the reference calendar. And if you open that document, you'll see that that talks about when our schools can practice, when they can play, and uh, the number of contests. So for reference, if any of you have questions about thoughts, impact, et cetera, that's where you can find those, that, that information. So this is just a report to you. Uh, we will obviously, based on any discussions you have today, uh, amend as needed. Okay, so it's more just presented for your information. So uh, in the regular meeting, and just as a reminder, because it's our first meeting of the year, we will normally look at these kind of meetings, or these kind of items, and you all need to object to the chair if you don't want it taken to the work to the full meeting of the work session. Okay, are we comfortable? And all three of those uh, attachments are simply just reference documents. And so this one, if you look in the recommended motion, says to accept the report. So when we get to the full meeting, that's what we would need. Okay. So as we work through this first meeting together, we'll try to keep you procedurally uh, inside the lines. That would take us, uh, Mr. Miller, to item 2.2. You comfortable with that, sir? Any objection to move to accept the report? Okay. And moving forward to the work session. All right. Thank you, sir. All right. Item two point two: Constitution, bylaws, and regulatory issues. We have tried to identify for you, <coughs> identify for you, a number of issues in the current rules that, because of uh, COVID nineteen whether it's last spring's actions or this coming fall, uh, you might want to look at setting aside or otherwise revising. Um, I can tell you that, that the first one is bylaw four, which is item 2.21. The relevant provision is that, of that is that normally bylaw four, which requires the enrollment of the student in a school they're gonna play for, Normally, that is verified by looking at infinite campus for the public schools and a comparable system for the non-publics, and they need to be an A1 student at that school. Staff's recommending to you that, uh, that we reinterpret that. It's an interpretation of the bylaws that we only use A1, but we're thinking we need to reinterpret that during this federal and state emergency and basically put the onus on the local school system to decide uh, how, what codes they're going to use, what codes they're going to allow and then report to us any student enrollment that is not included in their enrollment numbers. We would we work out a mechanism and we've worked, we work very closely with the Department of Ed and their data people, but we think that some people are going to do some things perhaps uh, with student codes. Uh, they may use A5 codes, they may use A7 codes. We don't want athletics to be the inhibitor in a district doing what they need to do to get through this, this fall. And, maybe even the entire school year. So we think it's got to go to a local control thing. And all we would say as part of the recommended interpretation is that we have to have from the schools any student that doesn't come through as an A1 on the enrollment reports. While you only use enrollments for membership dues, football classification, and track and cross country classification, a number of other organizations use our numbers. Uh, we provide our, our numbers that we get from the State Department for the Music Educator Association. We provide them to the All-A Classic Organizing Group. 
and I'm sure the 2A group uses those as well. So it's very important that those numbers be accurate. This has nothing to do, it, it's not tied to funding, so it doesn't get into those arguments, but because funding is involved in that number, it's generally the most accurate number. It's hard for a school to justify saying they need more students for, for or less students for football, but more students for funding. And therefore the board has always used this one amount. So we're recommending when you discuss this, uh, the recommended motion is there that, that you ask us to reinterpret that rule and allow the school districts to have a little bit more local control over the coding of students. Now, we would remind you there's very strict rules already in place for coding and how things are put in infinite campus anyway. But we don't think there's a lot of opportunity for for people to manipulate this just because of all those safeguards that are in place. And frankly, if we uh, hear of problems with that, we will no doubt do what we need to do, which is report them to the department, let them investigate. <laughs> it's very critical these numbers be accurate. So I hope that explains it. Uh, but we think we probably need some latitude on bylaw four this year. All right. <clears throat> any any discussions? All right. You see the rec <clears throat> excuse me. You see the recommended motion. We'll move it forward to the uh, regular scheduled board meet. With uh, if there's no objections. Can Can I just ask one? Yes. Clarifying question. Um, is there a mechanism in place for us? to see if there is a huge increase in a particular category. Yes. So that we can maybe red flag that to see if there's a potential issue on the front end before it gets too far down the road. We get in late November, a complete database dump of the 6,000 and some odd records that are in there for all the schools and all codes. And we could easily know by certainly before the end of the first semester, we'd be able to get numbers, compare, and take a look at that. We certainly can. And a lot of it is, in, is inherently, it's incumbent on the schools to properly and timely report, and then we can get that. Those that, uh, But they've been really good the last two or three years. We haven't had any delays. So we would have a safeguard against that. The, the challenge, and Kevin said this, uh, Kevin Brown, the interim commissioner, said this the other day on a call. The challenge is for districts to be be also cognizant that they don't want to do something that inadvertently creates problems that they do locally. Uh, for example, there's a big difference in an alternative program and an alternative school. And we've got to be really careful that, that they don't unintentionally have a problem. I think that, that guidance and information is continually flowing from KDE to the districts. And I know there'll be additional now that uh, now that the, the star school is a little more imminent there'll be additional clarifications we are just a benefactor of their work we don't necessarily control it any other discussion all right we'll move it forward next item 2.2.2 discuss bylaw five first day credit check mr miller we uh have talked about this a little bit over the summer uh and as <clears throat> you all talked uh whether it's one-on-one -on -one or as a group we did not want to make any early announcements on this because we didn't want to create an opportunity for perceived or real manipulation. Uh, bylaw five is our academic rule, and it, it is it is pro is rightfully titled. It's minimum academic rule, and most of the time our schools adopt a more rigid uh, standard than this bylaw. Uh, but the first day of school, according to section one of that bylaw, a student has to have the right number of credits to be on grade level, according to our standard, which is 20% for a sophomore and 45% for a junior and 70% for a senior. And we have had a lot of requests and reports, and these are coming from central offices. They're really not coming from individual schools or ADs. For us to look at that first day grade check in light of what happened last spring, in light of the fact that because transition had to be turned, and as Mr. Brown has said so many times, uh, our, t our people stepped up really quickly and turned the entire way they deliver education for the state in about three days. And that was a, an unbelievable accomplishment. But it, we've heard of situations where maybe credits, there wasn't the same number of credits available that might have been had we had in person. There was, and, and therefore, this whole credit count piece the first day <clears throat> may be unfairly impacting a student. The other thing that we've talked about all summer is that 
in the summertime with with an abundance of correspondence classes at a lot of schools and an abundance of university op- offerings, there was chances for some people to make up and catch up that have not been there this summer because a lot there hasn't been as much of that education opportunity out there. So what we are suggesting that you consider is a waiver of the first day credit check and let the local school decide if that student is on target to graduate enough to play sports. Yes, the unintended consequences, there could be a kid who uh, has not been adhering, has not been meeting the bar academically and may somehow get lucky on this. But the other side of that would be that there are a number of kids who may be affected who did everything possible but still mathematically can't make that 20, 45, and 70% grade threshold for, or credit threshold for this year does not take away the requirement that once school starts, they've got to be passing weekly. Uh, and I, I know that for some of the plans that are being talked about uh, for classroom instruction, particularly hybrid models, et cetera, the weekly grade check could be a challenge. But, but that's, that's got to be part of the consideration. How, how we're going to do this uh, for athletics. But, but that, that first day credit check is all we are suggesting after looking at them. You all ask us early in the in late in the spring, I guess, to look at anything that might need to be set aside for a year. And this is one of the ones that made that list. So, Mr. Miller, I think the recommendation <coughs> would be that we we uh, approve a blanket waiver of bylaw five section one for this fall and let local districts determine the first day eligibility. I'll make that motion. To move it to the regular. Any other discussions? All right, we'll move it to the regular meeting. All right, next item, 2.2.3, discuss bylaws 6, 7, and 8 waiver considerations. At this point, we, we were asked to look if there's any need to waive the transfer rule summarily. And we have a number of exceptions already in that rule. Um, despite the fact that we have 85,000 kids that play sports, the 800 that change schools get all the publicity. And... Uh, so there's, it's not as rampant as people would like to believe, but there's obviously transfer. And there was discussion early on about did we need to give people some choice, et cetera. And we've reviewed and listened to all the input from this summer, whether it's the Education Continuation Task Force or the superintendent's meetings, different ADs meetings. We do not see the need to set aside the transfer rule for COVID-19. We think that there's already exists a due process procedure that can handle individual situations. We also don't want to put the association in a position to where someone tries to use athletic reasons to move because they don't like the method of instruction chosen. We think that's an academic decision and a district decision, and we don't like the the KHSA perhaps put in the middle of that. So at this point, um, we would ask you to endorse the, the fact that following review, there's no alteration to the transfer rule directly related to COVID-19. Any, <clears throat> any discussions on this? All right, then we'll move that item to forward to the board. All right, next item. You know, bylaw nine is a, is a rule that has been in place for a long time. Uh, and it basically states that a student who has been enrolled as a freshman and then played sports, at, played basketball at any level, they can't play on an outside team once the school year starts. Um, that rule has, is, is every time there's been a proposal to amend that rule, our basketball coaches primarily, but our schools have risen and said we don't want that we don't want that removed there is some discussion this summer uh about potentially a waiver of that for this coming year i would point the board and anyone else to bylaw nine on our website that already has an exception that's about three years old and allows students to go to a weekend event a one-day event held at a university where university college coach or your division one and two coaches can attend. And our rule is written to where the exception matches the recruiting periods. What you are hearing right now uh, is the fact that the NCAA has had in-person recruiting shut down uh, through July 
and speculation is that's going to be extended through August for in-person recruiting. So once we start school in late August and September, uh, you're then going to start probably seeing events pop up, and all of them are not sponsored by organizations that, that have the uh, maybe have the kids' interest at, at heart best. There's some of them that are. Do not get me wrong, but the what we would we would contend that the best option would be that we continue to allow the exceptions that are in bylaw nine for events where college coaches are permitted to attend by the recruiting calendar, but we don't op often offer up. Uh, a, an open opportunity for other team play to happen just because we had COVID-19. It's hard. Right now, I would not want to be the parent of a rising senior athlete, especially one that's identified as a, a prospect, simply because I know that they've lost a lot of momentum that the summer normally brings, whether it's club play, whether it's AAU play, whether it's college camps. At the same time, if we are going to try not only to open up fall sports, but to limit exposure till we get further down the road on this virus, to have more and more team play just seems to be contra contradictory. <coughs> so our, our recommendation to you, and you ask us to look at all these and we kind of bounced them around a little bit, but uh, our recommendation is that uh, the existing interpretations uh, remain in place and allowances remain in place for events where college coaches can attend. And that it's, if the rule, if you read it, technically it applies to both basketball and football, but it has no practical impact in football most of the time because there's not opportunities for outside football available, not like there is in basketball. So we just, that's the, that's the last bylaw we, we've identified. Yeah. Make sure he's unmuted. Well, uh, to he had heard something to to the effect that you know it would it could affect her eligibility. Well, he, they pulled out last minute, you know, ate the plane tickets and did this and did that. But you know, I, I think so many times that just it happens. I mean, it, it's. Uh, I think Lucas has a camp that, that's like that down down in like Texas or somewhere, and uh, so some of these top kids are being are, are being approached all the time to go and do these things, and these parents think that that's a great opportunity to both approve and be seen, and uh, and get some training. And uh, I just think we need if we're if we're going to continue to do that, I just think we really have to make it make sure people understand that across the board because I just don't think they do. I mean. Yeah goes on all the time that's what i'm trying to say well with about twelve thousand coaches and 300 schools it, it there are there is some inconsistency there's certainly turnover i know one superintendent in room's gone they had four ad's in three years i know there is some some potential confusion i know that every educational opportunity let's talk about the rule in general every educational opportunity with regional meetings annual meeting or whatever that's brought up people miss it i understand it, the, the rule, the exception that the delegates passed three years ago uh, was strictly to match up with what's allowed in the NCAA, not what a third party vendor can try to do. That would, we were asked to identify, and these issues are related solely to COVID 19. If there's a fundamental change desired, then that's what our 280 members <laughs> need to step up and, and propose. We'll help them write it. Uh, I could tell you individual personal opinions around the table would, would disagree with the rule in a lot of times. Yeah. But that does not seem to be at least the last time. Uh, and I know uh, when Mr. Wyman's group was one group that I know talked about it, there's two or three others, it, there wasn't sentiment among the schools to change it. If that, But if that's changed, it's time to change. I understand. Yeah. 
Thank you. Yeah. So, so, but as far as what we're talking about today is did, did, um, what we're trying to focus, we'll do anything you all want. What we're trying to focus on is are there rules already in existence that because of COVID-19, we need to make a change. So as we, as we look at this and, and Mark, those are great points, Coach Evan, no doubt, but but if I, we just couldn't find a reason why this spring's cancellation and current play meant we should somehow set this aside when we're trying to start fall. You all may. Yeah. I mean, I thought it was only, I thought it was related to COVID only for the fact that it's an extra opportunity that that kid did get. Right. It's, it's the only reason I say that. Yeah. And I think you're, you're going to see some clarity when the NCAA releases their revised recruiting calendar. There may be some limitations because they don't want their coaches exposed that we didn't have before on their part. So I, I think we're going to, we're going to probably be together on this one this year. <clears throat> Any other discussions on that? If not, we'll take the recommended motion to keep remain bylaw permitting students to the uh, regular board meeting. All right, before we move forward, just make sure when you're talking that you unmute yourself when you're talking. All right, next item, 2.3, options and discussion, sharing of information and gathering thoughts for 2020, 2021, and the COVID-19 pandemic. Mr. Miller, if I can, and, and I, if anybody else, feel free to interject, but we've tried to provide you with uh, a, a small sample. Trust me, like I suspect our school superintendents trying to do calendars and then class options and our principals trying to do it, I suspect you all are on a little bit of information overload as well. Um, so we've tried to give you different samples of things that are going on. You have you have four or five groups there. I'd just like to make sure you all have had an opportunity to review these, but I would like to make sure that you see um, the type of things we've provided. Uh, the Kentucky Music Educators recently released their guidance for the resumption not only of in-person band, but of band competitions. And that was just approved this week uh, we were informed all along the way of their process, and obviously a lot of their processes will be a good pattern for us as we go forward as well. So we provided that to you as well as the National Federation's guidance on uh, marching bands and music education. For those board members that may not have picked up on this this summer when we talked about this, um, the, the NFHS has also participated through its foundation in a study that's going on. It's an aerosol study. And if you're following Google News and Google the word aerosol spread, you've got all kinds of things going on now. But the Federation has partnered with, I believe, the University of Maryland and, and Colorado. It's in that area. There's two universities that are doing an aerosol spread survey or a study that should be done the end of July. And it's going to really help us. So that's why that even though we don't have jurisdiction at all related to KMA, this is a KMEA. This is more about information for you. As that aerosol study comes out, that may also be guidance for us, because obviously, if the if the determination and the research-based finding and published-based finding is that there's less risk of aerosol spread than some have worried about, that gets into your crowds discussion. That gets into some of the other discussions that we may have later in the summer. So we're looking forward to that guidance. Um, there's also a a in 2.3.1. There's a PowerPoint that was done last week and. Uh, I've learned to be tone deaf to what people say when, when you make comments and, and they don't want to research them. They just rather comment on your comment. But the, the document called Resocialization Action Plan was a presentation that was given by Dr. Hainlein, who's the head of the NCAA Sports Medicine Committee and probably one of the foremost authorities in the world right now on adapting to the next phases of COVID-19. And one of the things that he ran alarm bells up for all the state offices when he talked to us was that was their concern. And again, they're researching to try to see where they are about the risks of basketball perhaps being higher than the risk of some of the sports we think about being high, like football and soccer. Uh, and, and it's in part because it's constant contact and, and, and also in part because it's indoors. And we're looking to get more guidance. We're hoping the CDC releases their indoor event guidance. But when Dr. Hainline presented that, it was a bit of a shock to us because I think like most in this room and most in the audience, people thought, well, football is a risky thing. You know, we just, we, we just, let's just debate football. 
And in reality, all the indoor sports are a little bit at risk right now. So uh, we're trying to, to keep you informed as much as we can. We also thought that as we develop uh, guidance late this summer for return to competition, um, UK's return to campus document, it gives us some pretty good things to incorporate. And not because it's in Lexington, but because it really does encompass statewide. And so we were able to use that. 2.3.2 um, is a series of guidance documents. Now there's one attachment that's been added since last evening. And uh, if you didn't look at it this morning, you may not have seen it, but the first attachment that is on there is a copy of yesterday's issued governor's order. We are going to, this association, as far as the staff goes, is going to remain apolitical. If you Google it, I mean, non-political. We don't, we're not taking a side on the politics end of, of, of orders and who doesn't like them and whose senator got somebody circuit judge to do it. We're not, we're not involved in that. We're going to execute this order, and we have to because, remember, we are an agent of the state board, which is a member of the executive branch. We really have no option. So we just want you informed. But that order on the last page has a couple of items, and this is the mask order. And one of the, one of the things that we absolutely relished being in there is on page – I think it's six, maybe seven or six, item K. And that is the exemption that, in our opinion, would leave it to local choice. Any person who's actively engaged in exercise where they can't get the, the separate, or they can, can or can't get the separation. And that's the same thing we've been saying all along, is that you decide if you want to make your cross-country people wear a mask, if you want to make your soccer people wear a mask. And if you decide to make it, then that's your local option as a member school. But this does allow some interpretation in that, and that was critical for us. Um, our recommendation will continue to be face coverings all the time based on this order. But there, there, are, there is some latitude, just like you have some in-class latitude, whether it's spacing, whether it's situational, you have some latitude. Um, and, and I just wanted you all to see that because that was, uh, wasn't published till last night and as most of you know, yesterday was issued about 4.30, so um, we're trying to remain in lockstep with that, and we're, the other arguments we'll leave for the lobby. They won't be in this meeting. I don't, well, we will engage. If the board wants to do it, do your board. We also have the NFHS Sports Medicine Guidance, and that is a widely accepted document. One of our challenges is that in the original youth sports order, um, they used a different grouping of how they classified sports, low touch, uh, medium contact, all these definitions that were kind of foreign to athletics management people. But we've tried to, as staff has worked through, we've tried to kind of make us give some congruency to that to where you can kind of see the comparison. Um, There's some, that document, I believe it's the one labeled definitions in various guidance that, uh, again, you've, you've looked, looked at, at, I know, in prep, uh, but it does show, show you the comparison. comparison. Some sports are in one category based on the NFHS guidance and one category based on the current guidance from, uh, from the youth sports guidelines. A reminder to everybody out there that's listening, uh, the National Federation is a federation of autonomous groups. They don't have any authority. They're not the NCAA of the high schools. They're a federation of 51 state associations. So theirs is guidance, it is suggestions, it is information. And so uh, as we go forward, while we'll keep those points in mind, it doesn't, it doesn't uh, bind us. Then you have a document for related to intermittent closures that the Department of Ed put out. Apparently my phone couldn't hear what I said. I apologize to all for that. The intermittent closure guidance, if our ADs haven't read that, they probably ought to because we really need to be prepared for temporary interruptions, either at the local level, the state level, however that works. Uh, we have had a handful of districts report to us, and that's not to say that this is all that have happened, but since the workout started uh, this summer, they've had to shut down. Various reasons. Uh, no, no yet, there has not yet been a report of athlete to athlete transmission. But there has been a whole lot of reports of environmental transition, uh, tra uh, 
transmission. We went with a group to the beach. We went to a group here. We went, but nothing related to athlete to athlete. And that is somewhat good news. Uh, a lot of it has been, as the saying goes with the health people, the community spread. And we got to realize that's going to happen. We've got to realize we may let's, – let, let's play it out like we all want. We start a season, and we're playing along, and we get a week before a district tournament, and a particular school has to quarantine for 14 days. They may be out of postseason. That's just the way this virus works. And I stress what you all told me early on, and I have repeated this a thousand times. We are hopeful that 2019 and 2021 look alike. But 2020 is not going to look like anything we've seen. And we've just got to prepare ourselves for, for things that happen. Um, you have a copy of our current June uh, guidance in there, and then under review of guidance document, NATA, which is a valuable sports medicine group and an ally to all of our states, but they put out some return to sports and exercise guidance. Uh, it, it is it has been published, and it has been independently verified. So theirs is a little more research oriented. It's been very good. Item two point three point three uh, won't spend a lot of time on the individual pieces, but just to try to catch you up with some of the things going around. We are involved weekly with calls with all the states in Section 2. There's eight of us. Uh, it, that includes Ohio, uh, West Virginia, and Virginia, uh, Delaware, Maryland, D.C., and us, and Pennsylvania. So it's a, it's a section that kind of starts toward the Northeast. We are all over the board in terms of where we are in those areas. Some areas that have large urban concentrations of population are their case numbers uh, are extremely high, um, especially when they have an area. One of those uh, uh, groups talks about the fact they have a lot of multi-generational housing, and therefore they're having to be more cautious because the kids and the grandparents are in the same house, and maybe even the great grandparents. And so they're they're having to be a little more cautious. So we're kind of we've got some guidance uh, north of us. Things are going a little better. Uh, certainly south of us, most of you have read the Tennessee adjustments that they've made, uh, at least, but they, but there's a caveat in all of these, the, the caveat that we can make an adjustment if needed. So they can either be more strict or more lenient. And we just share with you some document. I, I share with you the Maryland document to look at. Uh, I, I, I sense from talking to you all individually, and I suspect when we talk later on, maybe this will be where we go, but we'll be looking at getting a, a our next stage for us, or don't, I guess stage is a good word because it hadn't otherwise been used in our publication, we'll be start to talk about contests. If you look at the Maryland document, that's probably a good format, not necessarily identical content, but good format for us. So going forward, we'll, we'll try to keep that in mind. Um, in there, there's also... Uh, in the, in this has all been returned to school. Now, when you step down to uh, 2.3.4, which is resumption to play, uh, I think you probably all read yesterday, one of our neighbors has had an adjustment. Uh, Illinois was moving along pretty quickly, and they have pulled back a little bit. And part of that is a surge in cases lately. Uh, so the latest thing, they've revised their phase four. Uh, as of yesterday, uh, again, it's short term revision, then they're going to evaluate. And I think what we are seeing uh, around the country on the athletic side is the segments like we have talked about. We've been in two week segments are getting shorter and shorter because the data is changing so much faster. So I think that's what we're seeing as we as we gather. And it is up to other people. Um, I, I jokingly tell the people in the office, I'm a math guy, math and business guy. I'm not a science guy. And the science guys kind of debate and change their mind. We probably won't try to tangle up athletics and science and try to have the argument about whether cases are a better indicator, deaths are a better indicator, testing rates are a better indicator. That's why we have science people. And uh, so it's important that we rely on that expertise. The other uh, there's there's another document from New York that you may want to look at, which just format wise <coughs> might be something. And, and there's uh, has a little more polish, maybe, than some of ours. And I can remember talking to uh, Commissioner Brown about their first documents versus their next set of documents. They tried to polish up and make easier to read and less interpretive, less chance for misinterpretation, as Mark talked about with Bible nine, uh, rather than having 
10 bullets of text, if we can condense that and make it real easy to understand, then we probably help everybody, parents, kids, and athletic directors. Um, so that's some information from around the, around the country and around the guidance. So I just, I want to point that out. Um, the, the 2.3.5, there's some additional documents related to football. And obviously football perception wise uh, has a different set of challenges um, and, and yet maybe not as, as bad a challenges as some people would like to believe. The sky is really not falling, but we got to be smart. You know, we've got to balance safety and, and, and knowledge. USA Football just released their youth football guidance last week. And um, I'm grateful that you all decided to meet today because a lot of these guidance documents were finally released from people. But um, and really, they've got a great parent document. And we might be looking going forward uh, at something similar to that, where we can help a document that schools could give out to parents. Uh, and then the, uh, the the NCAA came up with basically a six-week planner for Division One, a little less planner for that to try to have football. Uh, I shared with you that I've met uh, with the officers, uh, regional people, et cetera, of our football coaches association, and they, they do not seem at all to have consensus that they need that long to get ready. And that's good news. That's really good news. Uh, if we decide that, that football is in the offing, uh, based on when we decide to start, that they don't think they need six weeks. I mean, six weeks would be a luxury. Um, so that's good news. And then the other documents that I, that I put on there for you are, are pretty important for us because we've got one sport kind of dangling out there by itself, and that's golf. Um, golf is definitely a low touch, and with minimal effort, the social distancing can work. Um, I say this partly in jest and part serious, those of you that have played golf with me know that you're guaranteed to socially distance. I'm not going to hit it anywhere near where everybody else is. So uh, uh, it'd be a long way away, but I have no idea where it's going. So, uh, but the nature of that game allows people to socially distance. And so as we talk about it, as we get the recommendations, we thought you should see this. I have a couple more documents that I'll post that I received overnight from Jeff Ackerson, the director of Kentucky Golf House, who has been a phenomenal partner this summer. He and, uh, and, and Brent uh, Palladino, who are direct liaisons, gosh, have they helped us with golf. And uh, they're, they're talking and aligned with the governor's office and Department of Health. They, it's really good. But these documents are on there. There's some guidance for uh, back to golf operations uh, playbook. Their version four was just updated. We had version three, I think, on our website. And now we've got version four that just got released. Uh, they do have tournament protocols, which may be important for you to pay attention to. Uh, and then their junior golf updated spectator policy. They have already gone in and adopted a spectator policy. Bottom line is it's two people per player. They've already adopted those limits. And until that, until we get further down the road with the virus, that's what they'll be sticking to. That's important because that means that's a golf community accepted document as we go forward talking about it versus us trying to create something. So, Mr. Miller, that 2.3 is all just that information. I'm sorry to take so much time, but I really wanted to be sure that everybody saw uh, and summarized those documents before we get into action items on the agenda. Any discussion on any of those items or documents before we move them forward? All right, if not, we'll move those items forward to our board meeting. Next item is 2.4, consideration of next segment steps beyond July the 12th. As background, and I apologize to some of the people uh, listening to us who, who know all this because they've been getting all the news releases, but in this room, we have three new board members. So uh, tra we're transitioning boards. I want to be sure that they're aware. Uh, we have stayed away in our guidance this summer from the use of the word phases in terms of any title we do, simply because everybody's phases are confusing everybody. I noticed in the, in the hotel this morning watching the local news where it's going Cincinnati news and Northern Kentucky news and the states use different names. And I don't know how the citizenry keeps up with all the differences. We decided a long time ago that two week segments, we had the first through the 14th was segment one and then the 15th through the 28th. And we've been in the 29th through the 12th segment and the 12th ends it. Now that's different and an important distinction in the original governor's youth sports order. There is no ending date. That's important. 
uh, it started that segment uh, or phase three for them started June 29th and doesn't end. So basically, until we see what's going on with this, develop alternative plans, et cetera, those restrictions remain in place. It's not our decision. And we are, again, we will we adhere to those. So when you hear people talking about, saw a social media post this morning about looking forward to practice starting July 15th, uh, no. No, it depends on what action you take today. Uh, we know, in again, 19 will look like 21, but 20 is different. And the more we can get that message out, the better we are. While also getting out the message that we're playing this fall. What it, we're going we're gonna to participate in athletics and activities this fall. We don't know what's going to look like, but we're going to, because that's an important message as well. Um, but going forward and in, in talking with all the other states and talking individually uh, and talking to schools, um, I think that we're, we're at a point where we've got to address the period that starts Monday. And it does not appear, I will just say this, it does not appear wise for us to take any steps that would allow more activity than is currently going on. That's uncomfortable. There's people that don't want to hear that. But our, our data simply doesn't support uh, an acceleration, in, in my personal opinion. And that's where I've got to hand it off to the 18 of you. Um, you there is on the agenda a recommended motion. And if you all would rather, I'll leave this to the chair. If you want to discuss first, if any of you have points you want to be sure to get made, et cetera, before the recommendation, or I can make the recommendation and then you all can, can discuss it's whichever way you want to do it, Mr. Chairman. Let's open up, want to open up for discussion. Okay, we're good. All right, any discussion on this matter about? Uh, I would just like to, as, Part of that recommendation is that we um, additionally set some limitations on the amount of practice time uh, during a week, um, potentially to something along the line of six hours um, that would give schools flexibility to um, do three days a week, four days a week, but it would be a strong limitation in terms of the amount of time that we have people together. I was um, reminded yesterday commissioner um if if we look at football in the fall that trying to limit the number of uh, of hours that people are together and i think the more that we can do that now uh helps us moving forward but um i agree that what we're doing right now i think needs to stay in place but i think uh providing that additional guidance in terms of the limitation on the amount of time per week would be um, and additional help to our schools. What, what are we going to have in a situation if we've got a coach or a school that said, okay, I'm doing my football team in groups of 10. You know, I'm, I'm going to continue to do the 10, 10, 10. Uh, and are they, or is it six hours per student or is it going to be six hours per, per just a team? Well, I can I can tell you that the intent of the the intent of the current recommendation recommended motion, which does include the six hours, uh, because of, of various discussions that we've had with people, um, the intent of that is that the students be limited to six hours. Part of that is the masking requirement. There's some, there's some give and take here. If you, if your district uh, applies the exception for active, actively participating people, part of the rationale would be we're only doing it X amount of time versus seven hours a day in a school and things that you're already battling in your local communities. So can we make a sacrifice? Because there's no opportunity for the coach to take the mask off. Coach is full time. So I think to answer your question, the interpretation would need to be that it's per student. And that way, if, if I have a particularly large squad with 70 people and I need to do seven groups of 10, then that coach is wearing a mask the whole time. 
and the these are alternating. The kids I just are want alternating. to clarify. No, no that's a very. That's, I want it to be six hours per school. Not no, it's six hours per. School. That would that, that would unfairly fair. address the larger schools and even larger teams, and not just football. That could that could impact soccer. That could impact lots of people. They have big squads. So I think the the thought would be that, that that's got to be a per student, and we're we're recognizing that there's people in your community. I know there's peers of yours that ask, uh, regardless of how many times the commissioner said, uh, the commissioner of education said it's it's apples and oranges when you're talking about sports, which has already been debated uh, nationally on the mask and students. Uh, but there's people that want everything identical. And you can be consistent and not be identical. But I think we've got to recognize that right now, athletics has a little bit of an advantage, even on yesterday's order. Let's don't squirrel that advantage by having three hours of practice a day or four hours, and all of a sudden now we're exposing for longer. Again, I remind you, there's no research been, some, been provided in all the information we're drowning in about person-to-person -person exposure during athletic competition causing a problem. Even the original professional cases in the spring were at a social event following a basketball game. So, and generally, it seems to be uh, there's a direct connection between bars and spread, but uh, we won't get into that one either. That's a societal debate. Mr. Hawkins brought up a great point that it will be a public mantra for us for the coming days, and I really see it being for the coming weeks. It'll be part of our social media campaigns. It'll be part of all of our news releases, et cetera. If our state wants high school sports, you're going to have to do with the CDC recommendations on masking, on distancing, on hand washing. That's it. You're making a choice. You are openly saying, regardless of your motivation, whether it's political or otherwise, regardless of your motivation, you're openly saying, I don't want us to get back to normal as fast as we could when you defy it. So we, we're going to, it'll come out from us. It has to come out as either policy recommendations or something. We, we can't be as, as there was somebody said earlier, I think it was uh, Mr. Evans when he was talking about Bible nine, y'all can't, we can't be at all 280 schools all the time. It's got to be local people. It's got to be a health department willing to do what they did in one district last week. They went out, there was absolutely no compliance with social distancing, no mask, and they shut them down. And the local health department has that authority, whether we like it or not. And if our, we hope that the citizens will come together and say, regardless of our personal feelings, this is what may get high school sports back. This is what may get college sports back. That's an important thing, a message for everybody to take forward. I love autonomy and I love independence. And I, you all know, I, I'm as good at arguing. I'll argue with anybody. But there comes a point that we've got to say, we're, we're at second week of July, the 10th. If we don't all get together on an issue to try to, to try to keep sports going, then we probably know the answer. But we're not to that point yet. Let's just encourage people. But I, Mr. Hawkins, I'm so glad you brought that up. And if I, if I may ask two <coughs> clarification questions, one, and one of which may be a little silly, but uh, or both for that matter. The, uh, when you're talking about extending as it is, we're still no pads or anything of that nature. Is Correct. that how I'm understanding the recommended motion? And yes, ma'am. Okay. And then, um, again, I know we don't necessarily oversee the marching band, but we did just speak of marching band and KMEA. Is, do you know if they're thinking about that particular guidance about the six hours per student, or would that just be a, something that the schools probably want to consider? It, it's, I think they've got a recommendation in there, Ms. Bumps. I have to go back and look at it again. Uh, but certainly exposure opportunities. And I know John has been super this summer. The director of KMEA, he's been super communicating with, with us and with schools and with Department of Health. Uh, and I suspect, because we actually shared notes about what our future document might look like. And coincidentally, some of their stuff looks exactly like our draft would. To your first question, I think if we do extend segment three, it's exactly as it is now. We need no ambiguity about that. There's no opportunity for additional pads to be held and people bump against it. There's no opportunity for it's just segment two or, or segment three continuing. Okay, That's you. what's recommended. You all have total ability to, to change that. Uh, I think what we would look at doing uh, based on, again, a tremendous amount of feedback from you all in our schools, we would look at at what date we decide to start, then we can start that acceleration. That may then drive the start of seasons. You know, there may be some domino effect here, and that's okay. 
Thank you. Yes, ma'am. So, Mr. Tackett, my question would be, I know that my coaches are going to ask um, if we delay the uh, starting what we would normally do July the 15th, if we delay a few weeks, um, and I'm not saying I don't support that, they're going to ask me, so when are we going to start the season? Okay. So I'm sure that at some point this board will have to make that decision. And I think if we could just give folks a date of when we would actually have that conversation, I think that would be fair. I think that that's contained in the next agenda okay. item. All right. So I, th I think you you'll be able to do that. Okay. I think the thought right now is that you address this segment and you also address the fact that you will be convening again to look at a plan for the season. We there's this is one of those cases um, as and I think Sarah and I and I know we've got a couple of other math people in here. We got too many variables moving. If we can solve the variable of segment of this next segment, then we can start looking at the other stuff. That will be a natural outflow. Those people who, uh, and this is my running remark, so I, I will just say this. Those people who want to know right now where they're going for lunch on November 1st are not going to be happy because they're not able to know going down the road. But we can at least tell them when they're going to get more data. Can I ask Scott, were you talking about six hours per week? Is that what you said? You may have said that and I didn't hear you. Six hours per week of practice. Okay. Any other discussions? So do you want to make your recommended motion? Mr. I'll be glad to. Yeah. The, the recommended motion uh, would be that the KHSA guidance and allowances for segment three of the document issued for summer play uh, for sports and sport activities be extended through Sunday, August 1st, except for golf. And we'll have a separate uh, motion on golf. During these workouts and those other sports and sport activities, it is strongly recommended that a limitation of six hours per week be instituted by each member school. And as we move this to the meeting, we can put uh, after the per week, we can put per player. Okay. Okay. And clarifications and allowances are to be continually reviewed for revision based on health data. If our health data starts looking good, if we get through the anticipation of everybody worrying about people who may have lost self-control on July 4th, if we can get some more data, you all will be better able to plan your school year, and we'll be better able to plan a sports year. Uh, and I think that's the intent. Uh, I will clarify, he said Sunday, August the 1st is Sunday, August the 2nd. So just for- I, I, it says second, but I did yeah. say the first. I apologize, right. That's sir. okay. Uh, any more discussion before we move that recommended motion to the regular board meeting? Yes, go ahead. You read, okay. So we'll move that to the regular, we got a motion to move it to the regular board meeting. We'll move that item for the regular board meeting. All right, next item on the agenda is 2.5, competition and rules considerations. Uh, we listed there for you uh, in the agenda the documents that have been provided by the National Federation, um, somewhat skeletal in some sports and, and meet in other sports. But what we just wanted to do is give you those documents. What these are, are exceptions to playing rules that the National Federation has issued that would be approved for us to do and still be in compliance with their rules. I'll give you a football analogy because it stays on top of my head. Normally, the football team box goes 25 to 25 during a game. This allowance would take it to 10 to 10. So an additional 30 yards of sideline to spread people out. Okay. As we develop guidance for contests as our next step, or as we publish guidance uh, for our next steps, these things need to factor in. So this item, Mr. Miller, the, the request is that as practice revisions, parameters, and guidance are developed, uh, these appropriate NFHS rules adjustments be incorporated. These are all things that their rules editors and their rules committees have studied and ha they feel like would allow us better able to engage in sport this fall. 
uh, we're still having to do the CDC socially dis social distance requirements. And I don't know if any of the staff in their sports has any comments uh, related to that commentary. So it doesn't appear so. So that one's pretty straightforward, Mr. Miller. All right. Any discussion on that? If not, we'll move that recommended motion to the regular board meeting. All right. All right. Next item, 2.6, consider fall season next steps. Well, 2.6 gets to right to Ms. Foster's question. Um, and basically what we are suggesting based on, again, feedback from you all in the membership, and we're not going to please the ones that want to know everything now. We're, we just accept that. Uh, that the commissioner's office finalize the development of guidance for formal practice and contest. In other words, the next step beyond what we're allowing now. Um, that we would do that in consultation with the governor's office, the Department of Public Health and Department of Education to allow for the regular season to begin. And such guidance would include alternative considerations to be considered by the board. So we may come back to you after looking at all the fall sports and say, well, we, we're okay to start this one, but we need to wait another week on this. Maybe we need to wait another week on this one. And the deadline in there, and again, I'm not reading, I'm kind of telling you what the motion says, is that we would need to have that ready for you to consider at a meeting in late July or the very first part of August, so that by that August 3rd date, everybody knows what at least the current plans are. Folks, if our, if our health numbers change the negative, the, the, the development of that will be a little different than if our health numbers change the positive. And, and then that will also, that will include freshmen, JV, because I know we, some of us talked about that Correct. in passing. Yes, that will include all the things. That I can I can almost tell you without a doubt that, that again, 2019, hopefully looking like 21, but 20 is looking different. The days of playing a freshman JV varsity triple header in any sport are probably done for this year. We're going to have to spread things out. Um, we've already talked as an example for people to hear. We talked about our state cross country meet. There's virtually no way you could run three races in one day. You're going to have to have one in one day and two the other or something with spacing to clean out restrooms. And there's just some things you're going to have to do to meet all the guidance. I also remind everyone in the board that I believe it's July the 13th. We should get a lot of answers from the CDC when they issue their revised guidance on the start of school. And that will that should inform us. Much like the other levels of sport, you know, I had a bunch of messages late yesterday and this morning about what's going on with colleges and what's going on here. Appreciate the information. We are informed by everybody sending stuff. We're not bound by what the, what some college league does. We're going to be doing what's best for the students in our state and the citizens in our state. And that may include, Donna, our Miss Bumps, as you said earlier, whether it's JV freshman varsity, it could be travel considerations. Uh, I know that I'm getting a lot of suggestions from, um, let's just say from Frankfurt, but not necessarily from governor's office, about travel limitations, because we can help control Kentucky. We may not be able to handle control in Georgia and Florida and things like that. So we, we're going to have to have some an active conversation about that. But this part would just direct us to put together that next step guidance. Said a question about the, the number you said the numbers get better. When does that come out, or is there a timeline that those are released that we can look at it so we can something to look forward to? I, I don't know how often those numbers well, they, that we're looking at coming out. The state releases their report every day, and on the Department of Public Health website, you can get that. But it's not just the raw numbers. They are doing they do internal analytics that that, that I don't know that it's published. A lot of it is positive testing rate. A lot of it is the actual number of cases, the actual number of tests. We're blessed in our state. Early on, our state, through the Department of Health and the governor's office, instituted uh, testing much more convenient than some other states. Our testing numbers are good. Our supplies are good. So they will have really good data to look at uh, much quicker. But it's not something that you're going to be able to put in the hands of every, uh, every person and say, okay, if we hit this. You remember, I think, what the what we went through with the whole declining, as long as it declined to a certain level, then you got to move to another phase. But nobody ever really knew what those numbers were. I, I know it feeds the paranoid type, but we just got to depend on the Department of Public Health and what their, what their information is. And their number one thing, and I think we've got to keep in mind, their number one priority, as is ours, is not the resumption of sports. It's the resumption of school. And so it may be a little more conservative 
than some other people. We've already had a state or two make decisions to not start back, a college or two make decisions to not start back in class, in person, and we, we're not at that point. We, our citizens have done a great job, and I know they'll continue. So this document that would come out late uh, July, early August, there's a possibility based on our numbers, how they trend, uh, that, that maybe some sports could start before others, we're saying, uh, based on the indoor, outdoor. So there's really not a way to say fall sports. Uh, everybody can start at this point, maybe in that document, based on the numbers at that time of what the yes, CDC says. So we need to make sure our coaches understand just because a one could possibly be starting. It, it, it could vary. Is what in this well, document will outline that? Is that what I'm hearing? I think actually, yes. And I think actually our, your next agenda item will be the best illustration of that when we talk about golf. They will not all start at the same time. You know, they don't start all at the same time now with our, with our current limitation of seasons, but a lot of them normally start practice on the same day. But our competition, it may be that football is a couple of weeks later. It may be that soccer is a week later than normal. It may be that volleyball starts on time or a week later. We don't know. The data will drive that, and we'll have to use data based on that really last full week of July, which is great because it gives us a 14-day period following July 4th to really see what happens. And if all the people that are worried about that rate changing in an upward trend because of July 4th, if it doesn't happen, then we've, we've appeased them and we've got good data. But I think, Mr. Smith, you're exactly right. We have to, and it's a good message for everybody, that don't, we are focusing on the seven fall sports, but that doesn't mean they're all going to start at the same time. Right. Um, I just think every, every coach, their sport is the, at that time, that's the sport. And they're going to want to know how soon they could ramp up going from the six hours to really preparing for that first official practice date versus the first official. And I know that's going to take some time, but uh, I think they're all going to look forward to that guidance at the end of July to say, okay, when can I now go from uh, my groups of 10 and whatever what that looks like. So uh, I know they're going to be patient and we are too. Yes, but, but that's just uh, it's tough on them right now. Well, it is. It is. And we and we recognize that that coaches are, are trying to plan. We also recognize that whenever you start this next stage of practice, they've already had the conditioning period that they might normally have started. So there's trade offs. I, I, they're probably OK. And I think as we meet the other people that will have to be a big influencer in this is our weekly get together with our superintendents statewide. Because, frankly, we, we've got some people that would prefer us to be on the conservative side with all of them setting dates August 17th to August 26th. A lot of them are in that range. And they probably want to – They the last thing on earth they want is our first ramped up practice to create an outbreak that now they got to delay school. So you are right. There's a delicate balance. And our coaches sometimes are, are the ones maybe even more impacted than the kids because they can't do their normal planning. And that's one of the reasons we fought so hard, as you all did, to get some allowances in June, to get that conditioning piece at least done. But we're aware of that, and we'll have to be ready to go with it. Mark, is there a question? Yes. Julian, um, just, just a quick question, because this is what I'll get going back home. Um, tryouts, okay? I mean, I know we're in segment three, and I know the limitations, and our coaches do, and they know them well. But, uh, you know, typically July 15th were the – the beginnings of tryouts. And uh, so basically we're saying that this stays in this conditioning skills period and there's really no tryouts for opportunity at this point in time because it's really not mandatory. Is that, I mean, what, what, what does that, does 15 mean anything at all at this point in time? No, oh, the, the, and that's a great way to phrase it, Mr. Evans. The 15th is out the window. Yeah. Based, if you approve the earlier motion, the 15th just became August 3rd, we hope. And could be delayed again. Uh, now, with the exception of golf, we did remember carve out golf out of that. So, so basically, what's going to happen is, as we as we monitor this situation, this this group, you know, based on what the governor and all that says, we'll we'll determine when we can actually call something a tryout. Yeah, as, as soon point? as as <laughs> soon as we are able to add, whether it's limited contact or regular contact activities, that'll be the start. We're, we're targeting August 3rd, Monday, August 3rd. So, so okay. That, uh, because I think that's an important question because people are going to say, well, can we do skills and drills and pick our team? Right. Uh, so the answer is no, not, not that yet. Is, 
Nothing could be mandatory till that starts. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> so, can I ask a follow up question? So, my uh, my coaches are asking, is this going to be? I'm, hey, I apologize, Miss Flush. <laughs> You're fine. So, <clears throat> right now, is still voluntary. Mandatory practice does not start until August the third. We're hoping it starts August third. We're, we're hoping right. our health data starts. In the event, that, in that the is event correct. That we okay. That is correct. We it, it is to to really lay it out for everybody. July fifteenth just became August third. Okay. And we're hoping we don't have to adjust it again. Go ahead, Trent. Um, two questions: six hours per week per sport. What if you have somebody that's in two different sports? Well, you have any idea on the, that, or is it just six hours per athlete? Right now, it's per athlete, and I would I would infer per sport. Your multi-sport people, because you adding six more hours of exposure doesn't seem to be in our best interest right now for po folks playing two fall sports. Now, one of the things you're going to be it's going to be a challenge going forward with the start of the season is what you do with non-season activities starting August third, because continuing to allow other sports to do things after August third is not going to be in the best interest of being sure we can start fall sports. I'll make that statement out there. So that, but that's again, perhaps a local district issue, but it's certainly a consideration we've got to give them. If you continue to allow spring sports to keep right on playing and uh, basketball and fall, winter sports keep right on playing, you're probably jeopardizing, and, and those athletes are on a fall sport team, you're probably jeopardizing fall sport. It's one of those exposure things. All right, second question, and I know we don't deal much with middle schools athletics, but in some areas they play different sport sports at different times than what we do at the high school level. So we're going to need some some type of guidance for our middle school. Yep, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah, yeah Mr. Lug, that's a great question because the ones that do play during our season, per the regulation, have to play the the high school season. But we also know that because of gym availability, et cetera, there's not there's sometimes people play middle school basketball in the fall, middle school in spring, different genders at different times. So we will can, we will factor that in as well with at least some recommendations that would come from the staff uh, for districts to use. But certainly the fall sports, uh, whatever guidance dates you all approve, uh, I'll implement with a with a directive uh, to the superintendents for middle schools as well, per the regulation. We'll keep them sane. Last thing we need to put our school administrators through is a situation where their high schools are precluded from something while the middle school is doing it right beside them, and you got community people with a problem. Right, Ms. Buck. And if I, if I may, thanks, Trent, for asking one of my questions. Um, the only other question I would have is I know we haven't really talked about them at all. It's right now our purpose is about the kids in the schools and we often talk about our coaches because they too are just as we've said want to get involved but um how are officials and i'm married one obviously so how how are the officials being involved in anything are they still able to have some of their meetings whether it be face to face with their signers or things of that nature have we talked to them at all we have but but you might share i know you've had a lot of conversations with our signers i know that a number of our people are already meeting yeah, we've had received word that a lot of them are already meet the fall sports are having Zoom meetings and Zoom trainings online with video sharing, going over rules updates, stuff like that. Staff is even working on having our rules clinics up here soon for them to continue to prepare uh, whenever we're able to restart. So that several of the fall sports assigners that I've talked to, they're, they're trying to plow ahead as, as best as possible. And they can, can they do, are they able to do those in, in person as well? Or are they only doing virtual? With, within the guidelines, the group is up to 50 individuals. Okay. So, okay. so they, if they choose to do so following the guidelines, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Bumps, I can tell you also that in talking to several of our signers, um, Zoom may be the way they meet regularly, simply because they've always been geographically challenged out looking at Trent. The WKC and the, the land mass that they cover, they've always had trouble having in-person meetings because they're so spread out. And they have found more attendance, more attention during their training and everything by having the remote meetings. Obviously, nothing is better than an in-person meeting. But as you all know, even in planning this meeting, we were not able to even make plans till the governor's order went into effect on the 29th and allowed a bigger meeting because we have too many people. I think Mike had a question. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, 
a couple of a couple of things. Uh, COVID year, we're right on par. Non-COVID year, and I'm, I'm so glad someone brought that up. We already start two weeks at least earlier than any other state in the country as far as normal organized fall practices. This July 15th doesn't occur anywhere else, except I believe Alaska. And Alaska has weather issues. They have to have a different season. Most everyone else, their practices start either the corresponding date that includes the 1st of August or the 1st of August. All the time when our staff attends a section two meeting, they are shocked at how early we try to have organized mandatory activity. And hopefully this might be a good time during this and we see how this functions and how this plays. Maybe our membership evaluates our schedule and perhaps thinks about revising or perhaps thinks about leaving it alone. But I'm, I'm glad you asked that clarification. In a non-COVID year, we are normally way earlier than other people uh, and, and as far as structured, required, formal practices. And as Ms. Slosher brought up, when you're talking about practices, it, it's really not practice till it's required. But that's a great clarification. Any other discussion or comments or questions? If not, we'll move that recommended motion to get back to in July, late July, or August, and give further guidance. We'll move that forward to the a regular board meeting. All right, next item, 2.7, consider start of golf regular season. As we have discussed uh, uh, earlier, um, the relationship with Kentucky Golf House has been outstanding, and they, have, uh, they were one of the early organizations able to resume activity. Uh, because of their great work with the Department of Health. And all along the way, I know that Mr. Cope and I have had at least a couple of conversations with them. I think Mr. Gangoli was in on one of those uh, where we've talked about what's going on this summer and, and restrictions and things like that. Um, we feel like that their close consultation with, with the Department of Health and their work with the governor's office um, has developed patterns that we could go ahead and start our golf on time. And that gets directly to Mr. Smith's question from earlier. That, that is probably the best illustration that there's, there's, it's just going to be different this year. And we believe that, uh, that we can go ahead. So there's going to be a recommended motion if you move it to the full board meeting that unless otherwise amended due to health, public health concerns, and those would come from either the governor or DPH, that we approve the start of the high school golf season with the first scheduled playing date of July 31st. All competition in con must be held in conjunction with COVID-19 guidelines and guidance from the Kentucky Golf House, Kentucky Junior Golf, the Allied Golf Associations, and Golf Course Superintendents of America. You had all those documents. Um, they already have addressed the number of spectators. They already have addressed everything. So if you do approve this, then what I see happening is in our notice, we not only put those documents on our website, but our golf people get a notice out to our coaches. It says here, Here's what you can do, but here's the restrictions. Um, notable among that is they do have a spectator limitation. And our, our intention with this and this recommendation is that if that guidance changes in consultation with DPH, it would automatically go to our high school golf as well. If the spectator limit, for example, of two spectators per player were to change to four then, and be approved by DPH, then it would automatically be for high school. If it's cut to one, it would automatically be approved for high school. We won't try to get into writing a separate thing for golf. If it pleases the board. Any comments on that discussion? So basically July 15th would mean something to golf and that's the only sport. Sure. Yes, sir. Yeah. And we carved out golf out of the other starting yeah, right. yeah. You're correct. Golf's limitation of seasons in bylaw 23 would remain as is unless otherwise amended by public health. Order. If, no, if no other comments, we'll move that recommended motion to the four board meeting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Got to unmute there. Uh, it's probably minor, but uh, would it be helpful in that where it says COVID-19 guidelines to say from the Department of Health or the governor's office, because that's very uh, it's a very generic statement, and I think do we need to be more specific with that, that it would be from our state organizations that would change that? 
I think the, the, where it says COVID-19 guidelines is from those four organizations that are listed the rest of that sentence and they have those documents you have and those are approved by DPH. So maybe I, we, we can look at punctuation to make sure that's clear. We do, above all, whether it's in consideration now or as we finish, whatever you do, wherever we can add clarity, let us know for sure. Because we're not, uh, we're not trying to hide anything from anybody, obviously by having everybody watch, but we just want to be sure that when we get it out, it's it we have as few. Our goal is to have anything we put out following this meeting have the zero need for a frequently asked questions document. Let it be clear what the answers are. But that's a good point, Scott. Any other discussion? If not, like I said, we'll move that motion to the regular board meeting. Next is closed session. We, we have, uh, for those watching, we have a regularly scheduled uh, uh, segment during our work session. This is actually, we're done with the COVID stuff um, as far as the work session. We have a regularly scheduled each meeting opportunity that per the uh, per KRS 61.810, we go into closed session to get a legal report. And that must be closed uh, as it will involve cases involving the association. My suggestion to the chair is we consider this a good opportunity for a break anyway, and perhaps even an opportunity if any of you want to grab things out of a hotel room. So I don't know if you and you and uh, Daryl want to set a time for when we resume so that the public would know it's 958. I want to come back at 1015 and is that enough time to give y'all? Everybody good with 45 minutes or 15 minutes. I'm sorry. Brian Station Math, I apologize to all the people at Brian Station for saying that. That's where I went, by God. Are we good? No, we're going to recess the meeting. We will come back with a motion to go into closed session. Is that good for you, Mr. Miller? That's good. All right, well, let's get back at 10 15. <laughs> I'll tell you about the strategy. And I like it. I like it. Come here, I'll tell you Marlon's even. Okay, well, the strategy is. Who's going to be able to say, no, that's why we have to we're on We're on the meeting. I noticed the way the state board does it, and they're getting used to it. But when, if we have a vote that's not unanimous, remember Maryland has to record the negatives. So we would probably ask you to record with your hand in front of the screen. That way we can see. Yes. Of course, we're not permitting anyone in, so. But it's good manners. Good, Mr. Miller. All right, welcome back to our um, good. Um, board meeting. Now we're going to have a, uh, Mr. Collins going to read a, dis a disclaimer about the Zoom meeting. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Miller. Uh, just want to remind everybody, as we have had to do in the past, and especially in our most recent board meeting, uh, due to the <coughs> COVID-19 pandemic, as well as uh, state and national declarations of emergencies, uh, Governor Bashir's executive orders regarding social distancing, we've decided to continue uh, to hold this meeting uh, via teleconference and, and broadcast it over the internet, consistent to some resources, including Senate Bill 150, uh, our most recent AG opinion 20-05, and in accordance with the Open uh, Meetings and Open Records Act, because it's just absolutely not feasible uh, to have a, a location, a primary physical location for where the general public can attend based on the restrictions that we have right now. Uh, the record should absolutely reflect, though, that uh, all KHSAA member schools, media outlets, as well as the general public have access uh, to this meeting. They can watch it live as it's being streamed over uh, YouTube at this time. And uh, that's all I have, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. All right. With that, we'll move forward our meeting. Next item is number four, member school operations and non-sport specific event issues, 4.1 status of regulation promulgation. Ms. Collins, if you will tell uh, 
everyone where we are with our regulation and the changes going through. Thank you, Commissioner Tackett. Um, as everyone knows, uh, we have basically an annual uh, process in which we um, give our bylaws and our policies uh, the full force and effect of law. Really, that starts in May um, when we take the proposals and review those that have been submitted for our upcoming ang annual meeting that typically takes place in September. Uh, we did that this past September. We had our votes uh, and uh, we move forward from that meeting after this organization or this board uh, reviewed that. And uh, we have started the promulgation process for our reg that is 702 KAR 7065. And uh, again, we, we take our bylaws, we take our policies and we uh, incorporate those by reference. And what that does is that gives our bylaws and our policies the full force and effect of law. We have already completed the first reading. Uh, we work with uh, both the LSAC, which is the group uh, advisory group of superintendents with KBE, as well as uh, sitting before KBE in our first reading. We did those on May 26th and June 3rd, respectively. Uh, on June 28th, we'll have a second reading before the superintendents and LSAC, and uh, we'll follow that up with our board, uh, with the Kentucky Board of Education on August 5th. And uh, we anticipate uh, that we will be filing the uh, administrative regulation on August 15th. And it takes a little bit of time because we have to go through public comment period, but soon thereafter uh, that is completed. The formalities will be complete and our regulation will have the full force and effect in law. Anybody have any questions about that status? It's, it's a very standard um, procedures that we do. Uh, both myself, Commissioner Tackett, and staff help with putting that together, and we work with the Kentucky Department of Education, who's been a great uh, resource and, and been very helpful in putting that process forward. We appreciate their help. All right. Any That's questions? That's all I have, sir. Not, I make we'll make a motion, accept the report, and move it forward to the a regular meeting. All right, next item, 4.2, approval of membership applications for Trinity Christian, Somerset Christian, North Harden Christian, and Foundation Christian. We do have, uh, we have four uh, additional applications for membership since our spring meeting. One of these came in, would have been in time for a May meeting, and the other three have come in over the summer. Uh, normally what happens is they contact me, and, and that means they get a hold of Marilyn. And she's got some standard correspondence that she issues uh, under now some staff revisions we've made. Ms. Bridenbaugh, who handles our emerging sports on her on her job description, she will be dealing with emerging members as well. And so these four, the normal protocol would be that we would approve their membership application, but it's contingent on some things. Uh, in the membership policies, uh, schools that are not formed out of existing schools have a candidacy period, and that's normally two years. And this is just information for some of you that we, we have, may not have been through a new school. Those recent board members know we've had a, several new ones. Um, North Harden Christian is actually a former member that uh, got out of the association a few years back. They're coming back now. There's actually going to be a fifth one. You all have already considered them. It's a little small school in uh, Madisonville. They ran into an issue with getting approval by the Kentucky Non-Public School Commission. Part of our regulations require schools to be quote unquote approved by KDE. And most of the time that approval is that they're an A1 or J1 or, uh, or I mean, sorry, an A1 or D1 or F1 uh, public school. But we also have three categories for non-public schools and those schools are required to join the Kentucky Non-Public School Commission. So Sarah's first task will be to check with the non-public school commission contact, uh, check with Stephen and see, and if in fact um, they're okay, then then we move on to looking at their application, uh, discussing with them any issues, consulting with their uh, ads, etc., about our policies. Get them introduced to Rob, who help walks them through the data stuff. What happens in their candidacy period is they are able to play games against our members. They're also able to play games against non-members while they're in candidacy but after two years they're now a full member we right now only have one candidacy period member uh, highlands latin school located in louisville will be in their second year and during this school year you all will take up the issues of where they belong in alignments uh etc 
once we see that they're continuing to meet the standards of a member school. So that's just to basically remind everyone of the normal procedures. We do have four new ones and would ask uh, the board when we go into full session to tentatively accept those membership applications pending review. Uh, and if those criteria are met, we'll put them in candidacy status. Ms. Bridenbaugh, anything you've encountered with any of these new ones that you want to share, particularly with the new members? Anything at all? But no, nothing really to add that they have started reaching out to ask about questions, bylaws and getting entered in the system and, and particularly the scheduler as they start to, to get into our playing our schools and getting in the scheduler to try to get on schedules. But. A number of our rules do not apply uh, to the candidacy members. Some of the report requirements are not there. They get this time to transition and they do not get to play postseason during their candidacy. They can only play regular season contests. Same limits as our schools, so they don't gain an advantage there. But a lot of times they're exhausting prior contracts. There's a couple of different leagues that, that we have talked to, or I've talked to especially, uh, that their organizations may or may not be uh, longstanding. They may go ahead and, and not have an organization. I think they're looking for a way to have some organized competition. So again, we'll ask you for that in work session. If I mean in full session, if no one has a disagreement with it being on there, Commissioner, are they, are they bound by the? I, I talked to Highland Latins. It was an issue with them. Are they bound by the uh, use of our officials for all of their contests? If they join the policy board, yes, they could independently get them, and they just got to use licensed people. Okay. So okay. they what they can't, what they can't do is guarantee that our schools will accept games if they're not using that. That's, that's the leverage our member schools have. Is, and this is not to Highlands. This is to every, not Highlands Latin. This is to everybody uh, that's new. They're, they're going to say that I'm going to keep getting the same Johnny and Bobby that have been doing all our games, and your people don't have to play them. They said, no, we're not, we're not doing that. We're going to use the assigner. So it's a little bit of negotiation in terms of the game contract. Any other comments or discussion? If not, we'll move that recommended motion forward to our regular board meeting. Next item, 4.3, schools with no Title IX and participate, participation reports. Just wanted to brief you a little bit uh, about what's going on and ask Darren and Rob perhaps to detail uh, if they have uh, knowledge on specifics. But we have uh, April 30th is a key date for our ADs in most years, our principals and subsequently our ADs or designated reps. That's the submission of our reports about participation and for those schools that are subject to Title IX, which is everyone except our single gender schools, um, that they have to finish their Title IX report. It's all automated for them. They've done the data correctly. We did have, we extended that deadline to the end of May this year. Um, and really the, the most laborious part of that is the financial expenditures and remind the, the new board members in particular that those expenditures are last year's expenditures, not 1920. So there's not a lot of excuse for not having it because it's a year old data anyway, but it is required to be submitted. And at the end of the day, I think originally when uh, Darren and Rob reported to us in, in our staff meetings, we were down to about four that had submitted and I believe it's down to about two. But if you want to go into the details and I would just ask the board to be cautious in discussion uh, we, we will institute any needed sanctions. You all are the appeal board for this. So I want you to be very careful about commentary. You know, questions are good, but commentary might not be. So Darren, do you want to talk about where we are and specific schools that are involved? Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Tackett. As Mr. Tackett said, we extended that deadline to May 31st. He had sent out a, a detailed um, post with all the information for how schools could complete that report with some concessions based on, you know, the year being shortened by COVID-19. As he said, Mr. Catcher and I, after the deadline had a handful of schools that had not completed that, we reached out via email and via telephone and were able to work with, with uh, a couple of those to get things done if they were held up due to technical issues or personnel issues because everybody had been ordered to stay at home. The two schools that were remaining were Evangel Christian and Rose Hill Christian and we did reach out via email and by phone on numerous times to give them opportunity to get that report completed. Um, 
Never heard back from Rose Hill Christian. Had a little bit of interaction via email with Evangel Christian, who had some personnel issues. But those are the two remaining schools that did, did not submit that report. We do feel like they were given ample time and opportunity beyond the deadline to get that done, and they failed to do that. Thank you, Mr. Wilbur. And I, I will tell you that in doing some other follow-up, uh, myself and other staff members, both of those schools had a complete turnover in administration. We're talking superintendents, principals, ADs, and there could have been some communication issues. Issues We might ask those of you that are in the area with either Evangel or Rose Hill if, if you know of information or can reach out and perhaps assist in getting that finalized. Um, to be honest with you, the penalties range from a mere warning all the way to the fact we don't renew their membership. And this is a key report. It's something, it's about the only thing that's mandatory each year. And we have spent a good deal of budget money over the last 10 years making that report just about automatic. You don't have to do a lot of things like maybe you used to have to do. So I dare say, I hate to say it this way, there's not a whole lot of excuses, uh, but if there are special extenuating circumstances, work with Rob and Darren. Uh, Darren's the front line on this because of the Title IX piece, and both of these would be subject to a Title IX report, not just a participation report. But Rob, was there any other things you discovered in talking to those schools? No, sir. It was mainly the ones that I did help. Uh, I know we had the two that, that didn't get completed, but the ones that I did help, they uh, they were basically all new employees as well. So I just okay. had to kind of walk it through with them. Well, we gave an extra month because we knew that there was an extended period of time uh, in April that uh, the ADs not only weren't in, but weren't available to go in their offices, didn't have access to information. Um, I will tell the board, just so you know, late last fall, I'm talking about the fall of 19, the data entry was revised and open for the, for the financial information, and many people went ahead and did it. Uh, those same, those same people, people Ms. Foster, Foster, that want to know exactly practice dates, they, they, they had already done it. And, and, and that's, that's that's something we continue to encourage people to do is, is when that, when that because we open that one up early on purpose because we know that's the slowest part. The rest of it's all based on rosters. So it was uh, fairly straightforward. But again, if you all would communicate with Darren, if you know specifics about those two, the, the last thing we really want to try to do is discourage membership, but there's certain things they have to do. So I think uh, going forward, all, all we would do is endorse that, they're, that you're recommending we continue to try to figure out the situation and then preserve your appeal on that. Okay. Any other discussion on that before we move it forward? Well, we'll follow the recommended motion and move that, endorse that motion forward to our regular board meeting. Next item, 4.4, .4, NFHS Network Report Pixelot. Well, I don't, I don't, I, let me give a, a little bit of data. And, and part of this is because we're kind of on the inside with this. So uh, we do have, we're one of three states that's represented uh, on the NFHS board of directors for the network. Um, I'm serving in one of those positions. And, and I can tell you that this offer that's been made by the NFHS network could potentially be a game changer for our member schools. Um, this Pixelot is an automated camera. For those that haven't seen it, they have demonstrated at our meeting for the last four or five years. It is either three, it's either two, three, or four, depending on your configuration, but different cameras. And the technology is such that it can follow play without an operator. So it is true automated. The provision that they've got, the key provision for them is you get the camera and they get the content of your broadcast on the network. The permission, I will tell you this, we've had this question come up, the permission form for athletes that the athletes sign each year and the coaches, their uh, parents sign each year, already gives permission for the image if you ever worried about that. They've already released that. But what they have done recently is working with investors, they have uh, infused $200 million in capital into this network to try to help make it the preeminent network for a high school age group and keep some of the other profit centers out. To do that, they have now made an offer to all member schools, and it's only till the product runs out. And they had 40,000 units that they have purchased. But they're offering each member school two units. Their planning is that it's one for your gym and one for your field, but you can decide it's somewhat some other configuration. 
We, we also have very small group, very small schools that have talked to us about the fact they only need one. They don't have a field. They only have a gym. So we're trying to pair up schools together so we don't get odd numbers of units. But that's a network thing. That's not a KHSAA thing. We're, they're trying to make this work. Your obligation as a school, as I look, I see Ms. Barnes, uh, who I'm sure in her last few days is going to commit the money for this. But the Henry Clay High School could decide that they want these two units uh, going forward, and they're going to get the units free, which are normally around $5,000 per they have been varying prices. Uh, they've been as low as 3,500 and as high, I think, as five. They're giving the schools those units. You just have to install, and you have two choices for installation. I remember schools do. You can have your people do it to their specs, or you can pay a 20, our schools can pay a $2,500 fee, and they'll come in and install both of them. They'll do it, turnkey. All you have to provide is an internet connection. That connection does not have to be on the state network, but it does have to be a hardwire reliable connection. I've already talked to two schools in the last 24 hours that they have gotten their local telephone or tele telecommunications company to do the one for the stadium because they didn't think about putting internet in the stadium when they first built it. But they got something else somewhere. You got to, you all, we want each member school making that decision. That's your only commitment so they can plug into their unit. That is an incredible opportunity. And why is it an opportunity for our schools? First of all, instead of paying another company $3,000 a year per camera, as another company charges, you got a one-time installation fee and you're done. Secondly, is there is a revenue share opportunity for our schools. Now, on July the 10th, these decisions have not been finalized. But I think in all likelihood, we all realize that attendance is going to be limited at high school events, at least for the foreseeable future. There are revenue opportunities for you to sell subscriptions. And you could sell subscriptions for their normal recommended rate is around 70. And I'll have Joe talk about student program in a minute. But their normal program is 70. And you keep a large portion of that. You could sell it for less and get less. You could sell it for more and get more. You can turn it into a fundraiser. And you sell that subscription, a year-long subscription, to events off that camera for a fixed amount. And your school district can, or school booster club or whatever you want to do can make that money. In light of a loss of ticket revenue, we really wanted to try to get something available to the schools to try to help offset that. Because we know in some areas, let, let's, play, let's play the if and game. And let's play that down the road, attendance is restricted to somewhere between 33 and 50%. Well, in some districts, that's the most they're going to get anyway in some games. In other districts, that's half what they would normally get for key games. So we, we really fought as a network and, and the two state association people and the federation person really fought the, the board on let's get something that can help our schools. Now, as Mr. Wyman has asked me, there, there are pricing variations. The local district, you know, if, if uh, Mr. Coldiron decides 70 is too rich for his school, he, could, he doesn't have to charge that, but he wouldn't get as much either. They've got a standard pricing plan. Bottom line, though, is you're committing to give them content. It's worth the revenue to them to get your content. It's worth giving up the cost of the camera. This is strictly a business deal. And it is the NFHS network. It is affiliated with us and our network. It's not a third-party commercial vendor. We don't have any you know, obligations and restrictions and legal ability to tell you this is the only one you can consider. But I can tell you that there's also advantages down the road to people that are in the NFHS program, including Pixelot. Uh, for example, we have a number of schools that each year reach out to Joe for credentials to some of our events. And the webcasting permits have a fee. And that fee can be waived for network schools. It's, enough, it's worth it to us to get our product out there during the regular season to where we'll give up on a $200 rights fee or $150 rights fee. The other thing I would tell you to continue to please advise the members. Those of you that are allowing people to come in and stream your contest for free, are doing yourself no favors, especially in a time when we may have revenue reduction due to ticketing. Why people would think they should give away a product and let people stream it and other people sit home and watch it for free on TV when you're charging grandma that comes to the game or mom and dad that comes, it just, from a business standpoint, pull back from the sales pitch that might've been given you and it may not be the best business move. 
And I can tell you, it, this next year will be lean on booster club budgets and athletic budgets. I think everybody knows that. Uh, there's going to be less money available. So it's a great opportunity. You've seen some of the news releases. We uh, the, the network put one out. Some some of the people have already called our school. Our schools they've offered. We will set this up n Monday. Uh, we did not. I did not even sit down with Joe and talk about scheduling. But we will have a statewide webinar on that. That they will go in and do it all at once, so we don't have to have 300 separate meetings uh, next week. And we'll let you all know that date, so you can tell people about it. When we put that out for the ticketing program, Dan, will we have 85? I believe 85 schools joined in on the the online ticketing and and uh, hand uh, computer ticketing program. We know our districts are looking for some help, so we're pleased that that's coming. Now, Joe, that also dovetails into the student broadcast program. Do you want to talk about? They do have opportunities to involve announcers, involve other things. Yeah, I mean the cameras are are unmanned, so there's no manpower required to run that but you know you can pair your ready regular radio broadcasters with it so you have audio on the video but the school broadcast program is aimed to get kids involved and show them a potential future career opportunity and the nfhs network has an awards program where they recognize these kids that are these student-led broadcasts so it's a great opportunity if you have a media department or you have kids interested in that field to kind of get them involved and show them a future career path there's probably none of you that can't think in your student body of that person who would be ideal to be involved in that. And I can tell you, as Ron Popeil used to say, it really is the pixel lock. Once it's installed, it's set it and forget it. It really is about you put in your schedule. It automatically can kick on. Some of you that have the upgraded Musco light system know you just set a time it comes on and call them if you need to change it. You can do it all from your phone. That's exactly the way the pixel lock works. Uh, it's, so it's a great opportunity, and instead of having to deal with someone who wants to charge you an annual fee or charge you a higher fee, uh, it does, as Joe said, the key thing that, that is a new thing in the last year is the ability to simply plug in whatever your audio source is right to the camera unit, and now you've got play-by-play. -play. But even if you don't, you've got a freshman volleyball game played on a Tuesday afternoon, and nobody hardly uh, is coming but – you got mom and dad that are traveling. You got grandma in Florida. You got somebody else, and they can go on there and watch it. And they pay the subscription fee. When you break down the cost of a seventy dollars subscription at five six bucks a ticket uh, for a year, yeah, you're probably getting a deal on that. And this way, they're also helping your athletic program. So we're pleased to announce that. It's just a report, but want to be sure it's there. If if you buy the subscription, can you watch the games across the state, or just for one particular school? You, you, you not only, and that's a good question, Mr. Atkins, when you buy the subscription, you not only are able to see your school and your state, but the country. Wow. It is not a cold down program. And we have spent, as a staff, Dan, Joe, and Rob, I think were the three involved. We've even taken a lot of our archive broadcasts from us, eight to 10 years. They're now on the network. Our most viewed program right now is the 2014 state basketball final. But all of you that have streaming TV know that the most viewed programs right now are some old baseball game or some old. So we're, we're, we're recognizing that. What the network wants is views. And they will work with your school on advertising conflicts. They may agree to put some of the national. They have only have a limited number of national ads, but they may agree to put them in what's called the pre-roll, which is right before a game starts or maybe a halftime, so that ads that you have available and you do get advertising. With the network, you can put static ads. You can put, they don't have to be fancy. They could be something that you just, I can see, I can see Miss Bumps right now. I said, come to so-and-so's uh, uh, novelty stand and be glad to give you $10 off because you said you saw this broadcast. And you can now have an ad there. So there's lots of opportunities. And I can tell you from the corporate world, from what Mr. Cope and Miss Little tell me about their interactions and my own interactions with sponsors, any opportunity that you can give them electronic fulfillment is an upgrade from the baseball outfield sign. It's a good opportunity for high school. So, if, you, if you commit to this program, is there a minimum number of subscriptions you have to sell? No. It's just if you commit yeah. and sell one, you're, you're, you're still... The commitment is based on, of course, every agreement they can tailor because they recognize that some of you have established contracts with people and you may need to send something two different ways. You know, their only, conf their only commitment is if you are getting a free unit, 
your broadcast will be on the network behind a paywall. You can also do it, they can partner to others. We do that, we do that ourselves. We have people that we will, simul we will split the broadcast with and the network works that out really well. So you're not obligated there and you just have a commitment that when you do a, a streamed event, you are doing it for the purpose of getting it on their network. We had a school last year pay the full freight Seven thousand some odd dollars uh, was the discount deal they got for for two uh, two units, and plus installation, and didn't do a broadcast. They couldn't get everything worked out. It sat there all year, so it's really a no risk thing at all. Good. All right. Any other? Okay. Well, with that motion, we'll accept the report and we'll move it forward to the regular board meeting. Next item on the agenda, 4.5, status of 2020-2021 financial aid reports. This is not an action item. Uh, it doesn't even need an acceptance of the report, but I've asked Ms. Breidenbaugh to kind of brief you where we are. A little bit of a reminder to both the, the carryover board members and the new ones about a change in timeline that staff brought to you uh, last year and where we're going to be on that, Ms. Breidenbaugh. Thank you. Um, just a reminder, we did copy you on the notice we sent to schools about mid-May um, for the 1920 financial aid report, uh, moving that to the fall. Uh, we did make that adjustment for a lot of reasons. Um, we had kind of sort of talked about moving it to the fall before so that schools could finish up their fiscal year and get us um, accurate information. Um, but in light of COVID, it, it kind of was good timing so we are also in the midst of all this revamping um, that survey to put out to schools um, and, and making some of the questions a little more user friendly to get some of that information. For those of you that don't know, that is bylaw 11 with our financial aid policy, where we ask our schools, all member schools, private and public, um, to answer these questions about financial aid, whether that be need-based aid um, or or the financial aid pay merit aid as well. So if there are questions about that, we have moved that to the fall. Joe and I are working on revamping that schedule um, and, and gonna put that out later this fall. Questions regarding the financial aid report. All right, next item, 4.6, annual meeting agenda and transition to online meeting for 2020 only. If you please the chair, I can cover 4.6, 4.7, 4.8 and 4.9 at once. All right and then see if there's any commentary. We, we have, have made, made the decision internally uh, based on a lot of public health guidance that a lot of our things that we do in late August up to the 1st of September, we are transitioning to online meetings. We will not be having an in-person annual meeting this year. We will try to do a webinar type meeting. Uh, and I don't wanna, that noun is not specific to Zoom, uh, but a, more of a presentation to our schools uh, regarding, regarding the annual meeting the regional meetings, our new administrators workshop, and our Title IX meeting. The more we talk to senior school administrators, the less it seemed wise after all of this to ask our administrators to have to get out of school about the time you get back in to come to meetings. So we will do that meeting virtually this year. We will try to have the same content. Uh, we will try to have the same presenters. What we will likely do, just so you know, on the annual meeting, we will pick a date that will correspond to our regular dates, keeping in mind that as of this, as of May 1, which was the deadline, we have no proposals to vote on for changes to the bylaws. So that one session is kind of moot this year. So the rest of it will be educational, informational. I, I would remind you that meeting is not required for our members. 4.7, the regional meetings is required. What we will do is, we, we, and we haven't really gelled on exactly the format, we will either present one version and show it multiple times or try to do multiple separate ones and do it in a way, one alternative would be to do a larger Zoom meeting. I shared with you all earlier in the summer, we spent some money upgrading our Zoom account and uh, it, it was a you know thousand dollar plus expenditure for us, which for us is a big expense, but it does allow us to have up to 300 simultaneous people on a meeting. So we have thought about having multiple versions of the regional meeting and requiring registration like you all did today so that we know who was there. We don't have to do a sign in and we would know it by the registration and the record. So that meeting is required and we've already started looking at accommodations on that. 
The new administrators meeting probably is our number one evaluated meeting each year, the last three years since we've done it, because a lot of our newer ADs are swimming in all the paperwork and contract that we don't understand. What is the financial impact? Uh, I know we have some sponsorships at our annual meeting. Well, a good thing, uh, Mr. Good. Billings asked, and I hope I'm coming through, Rob, because I'm getting a, a intermittent error on the connection. Are we okay? Thank you. Um, Mr. Billings asked about the financial, financial impact, impact of this. this. We, we have, have about $2,500 in sponsorships for our, for our annual meeting, meeting and, and meeting the meeting cost us about $12,000. So, so we, we will not be upside, upside down, down on the annual meeting by not having it. The regional, regional meetings cost us about 5,000 and uh, there's, there's virtually no cost to the administrative workshop because we're doing our office. But, but that, that is a good, we, we need to really identify cost every time we talk about stuff and I appreciate the reminder. Then we will do two Title IX meetings online. Uh, one of the things that, that I'll go ahead and cover, that's another one down, we have suspended for this year, uh, at least for the fall, the in-person Title IX reviews or audits where our part-time staff goes out and walks through the schools. We don't need any more people in our schools that need to be there right now. So we will suspend that program. That is another cost savings for us between thirty and forty thousand dollars. That is a the best way to say it, it it was an unfunded mandate years ago. It's now a service for our schools, but that is another opportunity. And so the Title IX meeting we'll be able to focus on the law itself. And our next item is going to illustrate why that's important. So I don't think Mr. Billing really need any action on that, but it's good information for everybody that's either listening or participating. All right. Anybody got anything on that? All right. Next item. 4.10 impact on schools of Title IX, Title IX regulation, regular changes. We are continuing to get updated. Uh, as a matter of fact, we had an update last week at our National Federation Conference about the recently adopted changes in Title IX. And while the procedures for handling harassment cases have gotten the lion's share of media attention, there are other issues that will impact our member schools that we just want to be sure they're thinking about. The number one red flag from a layman's standpoint, and then I'll ask the lawyer and our Title IX person to interject if they need to, um, the designation of a Title IX coordinator at the district and state and uh, school level is not just a button click anymore. You have to designate someone as a coordinator who has authority to address the problem. So it depends on duties you have assigned to that person. They may or may not be. They may be the person that fills out your Title IX report for us, but they may not now be eligible to be listed as your Title IX coordinator. And that's a big thing that our schools need to realize. They've got to really dig in on this one. The other thing is to realize that there's been some speculation that if we have an administration change or if we don't in November uh, and January's inauguration, that somehow this can change. That's not the way that OCR and Title IX works. This would take a multi-year process, just like this last one was, to get it changed. It cannot be changed on a whim or a signature. So, so I, I think there's some people, people out there thinking maybe we can fix this by doing this and it's not going to happen. They spent two and a half years looking at this regulation before they adopt the changes. Chad, I know well, you've, you've been in touch with people to talk about specifics. Do you want to start first? Sure, Commissioner Tackett. Thank you. I, I think the commissioner uh, has highlighted the most important feature, and that's whoever's going to be appointed the Title IX coordinator going forward is going to have to have some authority, which is a lot different than in the past. That's that's going to be the absolute number one takeaway uh, in terms of the impact that it's going to have in our school districts. You know, these changes are really due process driven because there are some identified concerns that folks brought to the table about wanting to make sure that um, all parties had an opportunity to be heard. Um, if you want to read them in their entirety, I encourage you to do so. <clears throat> You'll need four reams of paper when you print them because it's over 2,000 pages. Um, so uh, good luck. Um, it, it, this is not anything new in terms of the, the overall scope. I mean, we're really talking about three basic types of, of discrimination under Title IX. You're talking about that quid pro quo. You know, I'll do something for you if you do something for me sexual assault, which is clear cut, but, but the most important uh, one that really kind of gets caught in a lot of litigation for our schools and our school districts 
and has gotten a significant change is the third that talks about an unwelcome conduct that's a reasonable person person would find that is so severe, persuasive, and objectively offensive, and it denies access uh, to an educational program. There's going to be a couple things to take away. Number one, they're shifting a lot of the off-campus stuff that may not be a part of the educational program, and that's not going to be as much of a focus on the new regulation going forward. That helps a little bit in terms of what our schools manage, um, but more importantly, the, um, the standard. I talked about that it has to be so severe, persuasive, and objectionably offensive. It used to be or. And so that's a significant change because if you had any three of those elements that were there, you had a problem. Now you have to have all three technically. So uh, we are uh, monitoring that. We're making sure that both OCR and the other organizations out there that deal with some type of enforcement on this uh, are kind of plotting in that direction. That's our read from it. Uh, it's very. So we're, we're learning a lot on that. And uh, there's still going to be a lot of uh, um, investigation that's going to be required. And, and the standard for the schools is, is going to be looking to show that you're being responsive, that you're not being deliberately indifferent. And that's going to be the standard. Deliberately indifferent means I'm ignoring it. I'm not doing anything. Um, and so th those are, I think, going to be um, manageable changes to the school district uh, in terms of how we go forward. But we also have to understand the Title IX coordinator has changed dramatically. So I think overall, these are going to be manageable situations for our schools, but we're learning as we go forward. And as I said, it doesn't even effectively um, start until August 14th. So that, that's my takeaway from there. I think Darren might have uh, some additional information as well. Thank you, Mr. Collins. The only thing I might add in that regard is that the, the designation of a contact based on some of the things that the commissioner's already addressed, and I think the next agenda item will help us um, streamline this as we're work, working remotely versus in person. So I think that would, would certainly help facilitate some of the other things that we're going to be doing in regards to Title IX as well. As Darren mentions, we, we've actually talked about uh, adding another position to our school database that would be Title IX report director versus Title IX coordinator because coordinator now is a term of art that we've got to be really careful our schools don't mess up on. So that's just an update, uh, uh, strictly just an informational thing that takes care of uh, 410 and 411. All right. All right. Next item on agenda 4.12, consider revisions to prime date policy for 2020-21 only. Um, the item is related to uh, not Title IX, but prime date and it does use OCR's guidance. Um, I think as of now, we all consider that the sports seasons, not just fall, but the sports seasons are a bit unpredictable right now and there will likely be impending changes. So as we have discussed it internally, uh, I believe uh, the consensus is that we believe there should be uh, sus the suspension of, our, of the board's prime date requirement for 2021 only. It, long term, it is not a good decision because uh, I will tell you that OCR testified before this board and has testified, talked to us when we've met with them. If left to them, our schools would have to play 50% of their games, girls' games on prime date, if we left it up to them. We, bought, we negotiated, we talked and kind of got it to, to agree on 40% and multiple ways to count that. But I think in light of the fact that depending upon what happens with this virus, we could have multi-week shutdowns for programs to ask them to meet a 40% threshold this year might seem a bit arbitrary. So our recommendation is you suspend that requirement for this year. There is some consideration later on when we evaluate this toward the end of the year, what we do with the year following if schools are on two-year contracts. But we're finding in most of the initial research that really those games are moved around quite a bit to accommodate the 40% threshold. If we simply address 2021, we probably are helping most of our schools. And for the new members, apologize, Mr. Miller, prime date is Friday, Saturday, or Sunday as defined by the Office of Civil Rights, not as defined by the KSSA Board of Control. They set that definition. We only set to 40% how you get there. 
So the recommended motion, which I don't <coughs> think made uh, the first group uh, that logged in, recommendation is to suspend the prime date requirement for contests for the 2021 school year. And then we'll leave it up to you all to act. All right. Any discussion on that? If not, we'll accept the motion and move it to the full board meeting. Next item, 5.1. Consider annual evaluation of the commissioner per 702-KAR-7-065 per executive committee. Uh, annually, you all are, are required to, the, the regulation that empowers us requires you to hire, the, hire and evaluate the commissioner and the commissioner to hire the rest of the staff and evaluate them. So um, you, you, I, most of that was accomplished through the process you did in the spring. I will turn it over to Mr. Miller, Mr. Galloway, Mr. Billings, whoever wants to handle it. But there is a, a report that they simply want to make for the record that you will then need to accept the report along with any, if, the, if there's any action to be taken. And I'm out of this one. Yesterday, we discussed with the commissioner the uh, evaluation that uh, each of our 18 members did and was compiled by our board attorney. Uh, overall, it was a very good evaluation. And uh, I would, uh, uh, Mr. President, do we move, do we want to uh, move that forward as far as uh, the roll, roll over piece of it. I think, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Chad, we just need to, if, it, if we need to put it on as an agenda item on, and roll that forward, if we wish, wish to roll over the commissioner's contract, that would need to go forward in the next meeting and voted on in our regular meeting. Is that correct? Yeah. If that's the recommendation of the evaluation committee and the executive committee, then that's what needs to be done. And I think that would be our recommendation. Right. Any discussion on that? If not, we'll we'll roll it over to the regular board meeting. Or, all right. Assuming the commissioner wants to stay. All right. Next item: five point two triennial survey update. Just a reminder: we were scheduled in August to put out the triennial survey, which is where we try to see if there's new opportunities uh, that are desired by our schools. Uh, timing probably couldn't be worse. So our report would be that we will do that survey during the 2021 school year as we're asked to, but it won't come out at the first of school year. Let's, let's see what happens. Um, I will tell you that my intentions are, unless you have objections, we already had uh, a request to survey our membership regarding a couple of other issues, one of which was girls wrestling. And we will simply include that in the triennial survey. We'll only survey them one time. We'll add those together with it. I think we even had, if I, as I recall, a team tennis uh, discussion item that we will continue to have and decide if that goes on the triennial survey as well. I think it's already on there, actually, so we may be able to gather data for that for the future. Uh, Commissioner, I, I know that that survey is, is required. Is, is this, would this be a year to potentially push it back for a year just with the uncertainty of being able to have all of your kids in the building at any given time and to be able to do that effectively is that one that could be considered um, or is that not an option? Let me differentiate between the surveys. The Title IX survey is done every other year and that's where we need to survey kids. The triennial survey, we only ask the member institutions we only ask the schools. So what we're doing, I should have differentiated that. That's a, that's a good clarification. The triennial survey, as the title implies, is done every three years to see if there's new things, additional things, or things that we're doing that people don't want anymore. Uh, that's how we do that, is every three years. But the individual survey, if my memory serves, which it could fail, Mr. Bilberry, we did the last year was the Title IX survey year, correct? So that would not normally be done again, the Title IX student survey till the 21-22 school year. So those two surveys are different forks and we, we're okay. And we probably would wait and see as far as when to do it. We need about a month. Does that work? Yeah. I know you all have, uh, 
definitely done a few surveys lately, so you understand a lot of the debates. So that's just an update for you with no action needed. And, and the next item, if you don't mind me continuing, um, COVID-19 interrupted a planned study of what we were doing for future officials fees. Mr. Cope, I believe your discussion recommendation to me was uh, unfortunately no adjustment for this year. Let's just try to get to play and we would just bump that project. You want any other thing you have discovered through your work? Yeah, that would be correct because we brought it to the board in January. We wanted more survey results, got that for you from surrounding states and then COVID hit. So recommendation is to look at it next year. And we were looking at all sports. Right. What we will do is after the first of the year, work with our partner states and try to update our survey data and update our information and get it to you uh, for action potentially to go with the 21-22 school year. Everyone on this board, and I will say this to everyone listening and everyone in the room, everyone on this board realized we, have to, we need to address officials fees. We are uh, behind the times and we have kicked cans down the road, but boy, you talk about bad timing right now. So we are committed to the project. We will keep it as a standing reminder that we, we don't let we don't lose sight of some of the objectives we had a year ago. So thank you, Mr. Miller. All right. <clears throat> Next item, 5.4, disqualification penalty and options for penalty review. Staff has had a number of discussions over the last year and a half about the penalty for disqualifications. And interestingly, we had talked about some potential revisions. We have a, as you all know, we have a three game ejection penalty for a coach that's ejected and two for a player that's ejected in everything but football, it's one less in those. Um, we had talked about revising that. Uh, interestingly, in the interim, we have seen a number of states copy our policy. Uh, they're trying to address issues. One state really near here uh, just adopted uh, much tighter penalties because they're trying to get at some of the conduct expectations. It may be Pollyanna and it may be legitimate optimism. We feel like that if we, you know, if and when we get to start or when and if we get to start play, our people are going to be excited to play. We may not have to worry about sportsmanship for a while. So at least for a while. Um, I can tell you that as we look at this, one of the things we'll be doing internally is discussing our disqualification procedures that we want our officials to go through. We encounter a handful of situations every year where the officials acknowledge they erred and made a mistake. Uh, down in Mr. Lovett's area, there's an association that has at least twice in the last two years ejected a student athlete for two personal fouls in a football game when that's not the rule. Two unsportsmanlike conduct penalties eject you. And so they have called and said, look, we botched, we messed up. We're trying to come up with an effective procedure that we can work through local assigners and local schools and not have that come for a potentially arbitrary decision by our staff. We feel like that should be handled by the, by the official and by the assigner. So we're working on that. It's just information. We originally talked to you about coming to you about changes in what constitutes unsportsmanlike and what constitutes it. We're just not at that point. We don't think there's good consensus, even among our rules review group, much less among our, our state as far as what is. So we're, we're looking at procedural things. We're looking to be sure people are confident that they made the right decision. Um, and we'll still look at playing rules things. I know there's a couple situations for ejections in basketball that, that we really ought to look at, but I think it may require rule changes. We may have to use our staff's uh, influence on rules committees to get some of it changed. That's what happened with soccer. Soccer had a number of things at one time that were automatic ejections that they have cleaned up their rules to give some discretion, and that's been helpful. So just a reminder to you that we are aware of that. Uh, and we, we will be trying to finalize a, a little more streamlined process for ejections. All right. Any comments or questions on that? All right. If not, we'll move to the next item, 5.5, sponsorship discussion. Um, without, without a lot of specificity, because a lot of this is, is ongoing and truly changing, uh, we were blessed in the spring of 2020. We had a number of people whose sponsorship uh, to our association depended, um, to them at least, uh, depended greatly on fulfillment that was gonna go on at our canceled basketball, baseball, and girls basketball second half term. All three of those, that was key. 
and a number of them went ahead and fulfilled the entire obligation of their sponsorship. Uh, part of that is the relationship development that our staff and the sponsors have had. Part of it is talk you all have had with them. We did have one major sponsor to decide that he was not going to honor, they were not going to honor their sponsorship for an event. Uh, they did make a donation, which we're gratefully appreciative of, but they did not honor the sponsorship going forward or for last year. And we are in negotiations uh, with them, uh, potentially about an extension, and we will try to deal with those issues. We'll have some good discussion, and we may involve some of you in that discussion so that we can uh, have a fair, uh, a fair thing. We're looking as they are for partners. Um, and I would, I would argue publicly that a partner would have realized what happened and would have been, you know, been a financial partner. But I also know I don't want some, a sponsor. I don't want the person that sponsors our Tiddlywinks tournament running my office and I'm not going to run his. So it's a, or hers. It's okay. So, uh, we are continuing the sponsorship thing is challenging. We already have some renewals for the coming year and a lot of discussions. We do have a couple of sponsors that have told us they're going to put contingencies in there. Uh, we're seeing that a lot with our education institutions who, if they lose non-resident students, for example, they may not have as much funding available. And they may put a condition in there that if suddenly they have uh, no ability to keep people on campus, they may have to change. But we, we respect that. We do that as part of the negotiation process. On the board's agenda in the future will be discussion of how we solicit sponsors. Um, we are to a point where we constantly evaluate our agency that we have. And we may need to give other people a shot at that, or we may need to have them come in and show excitement and tell you that we're ready to go. We don't know. We, it's an ongoing issue. Mr. Colt deals with our current firm, L Marketing, uh, directly. Do you have anything else that we didn't mention? Just, just that we work with a lot of them on uh, had already paid and not having to give refunds back out of our funding and for the most part, everybody said, roll it over to next year, or you want to give me increased exposure next year, and, and I'll renew and pay my full amount next year as well. So um, without those people, we probably would have been refunded some months. Yeah, we had a number of people that uh, I had one sponsor, uh, two sponsors, and I'll tell you about in particular, our Hall of Fame sponsor called and said, it doesn't matter. We know you're not having a banquet, and we know we didn't have our turn, but we're writing a check. And we, because we believe in what the board does and what staff does. And that, that's the kind of conversation you want to have. We had the, a brand new sponsor who agreed to, while we were there on the first day of an event we canceled, agreed to a long-term extension and wanted to know, you know, what, yeah, when do you need the money and where can we get it to you? And then we had a third sponsor who offered to send the money to the house because he knew we were working from home. He said, I'll send it to you. I know y'all need it. We have people that are partners. Uh, we will have to have some heartfelt discussions in the future. Um, we've been blessed not to have this before, but we are in an era with sponsorship sales where there may be conditions asked that we'll want to talk to the board about. What if we had an insurance company try to sponsor an event that the part of the deal is we have to use their company for insurance? What if we had a food service place that said we have to use their restaurant? a bank that says we got to move our checking account. Those are issues we have traditionally not let get coupled, but it's different now. Again, we'll call 2020 different and we'll discuss and we want your feedback. So I think that's, that's really, really important going forward. And while we may have opinions, they may change based on your all's opinions. So I think it's important that we talk about that. The other thing I think you're going to see, and this is, I think this is really in the office's discretion, but I want to get it out publicly. I think our sponsors of a certain level who sponsor specific events, you might see us offer to change the title of our events. We've not done that before. When our board of control first approved a basketball sponsorship, a principal of a, of a high school in the east side of Louisville was on our board. And he was pretty adamant that we can't give up the name. We can't give up our name. Well, in reality, as the sponsor would tell you, it really doesn't doesn't matter if our name's in the title. If, if somebody talks about the state swim meet, it's a state swim meet. Now, the folks at panel love the fact that their name is on it, but you don't lose much if their name's not on it. So what we'll do is work work out a threshold and share that information with you, but certainly a sponsor that's, a for us, a, a, 
$25,000 sponsor is usually our first level of sponsorship that, that would get this. And if they are a sponsor of a state event, it might become the Trent Lovett State Archery Championship. And you know what? We probably haven't lost anything with that. One thing that's really complicated is our football title. You are going to see a change there, as I've already talked to UK Healthcare, and they didn't initiate this. It may very well just be the UK Healthcare State Football Championship. You need to have had a drink of water before you try to say the UK Healthcare slash KHSA Commonwealth Good Iron Bowl State Football Championship. And try to say it if you're a radio announcer at a timeout. So we'll be doing some different things to entice our sponsorship. That's all come from all the feedback that we get, not only from sponsors, but from other people that are selling. Butch, Joe, you've been involved in some of that titling stuff. Any thoughts? We good? Everybody in stream? Okay. If you have objections, concerns, please let us know. I will ask you this. We didn't talk in our orientation about conflict of interest. There may come a point where Mr. Garrison's on the board of some company that we're negotiating with, and he's got to say, uh, I'm out. I can't, I can't talk. If you ever encounter that, let us know. Uh, how close are we to moving forward with the sponsorship? I just think if we're going to – we're in a situation that, that if we start playing fall sports – you know, we're going to have enough on our plate trying to get fall sports rolling. Are we still on track sponsorship-wise, or are we at the point that we need to start talking about a third company or a second company or, or going forward with L Marketing? How far along are we with that? I just don't want it to hit us in the face, us hit a brick wall and, and say, oh, well, we're back to – we got to start scrambling to try to find somebody to sponsor yep. this, that, or the other. Good question. Yeah, I, I, I met um, – by phone and, and Zoom with Leah probably once a week uh, while we were working off site, trying to make sure we weren't waiting till COVID was over to try to start renewing. Um, you know, the number one question she gets back that she shared with me is, well, they want to know if we're going to play. And my response back to her is, we're planning on doing whatever we can to, do, to, to play to execute that. So it's, it's got a little bit of balls up in the air, but like the commissioner said, we've already got some that have already jumping on board, renewing the High School Coaches Association and BSN and some of those others are just saying, yeah, we're, with, we're in with you uh, no matter what. We are where we normally are in July, but we are monitoring that situation. And I can tell you that we had a, a, a of course, I, I could tease and say that we had a gentleman's agreement that by August 1st, we would try to have some negotiations finalized on one sponsorship, but we also had an agreement that they would write a check and they didn't. So uh, we're going to keep negotiating with that company, by the way. But uh, uh, we that one is being handled outside of L at the request of the sponsor. That's our office. So we're good on discussions of, of either uh, anything fall, I mean, winter going forward. We're really trying to get fall cemented right now. Uh, and I, I'll tell you the nature of the beast, even in a normal year, some of the what you might consider non or less revenue sports those sponsorship even the commitment from the companies comes right before the event or later on than we normally would and we don't have a lot of, of sponsors anymore that are not tied to a specific event or a group event for fulfillment well when we start when we start playing sports again there's right. going to be some pent-up advertising demand out there yep. so i think there's going to be a unique opportunity to to I don't want to say overprice our, our product, but there's going to be an opportunity to not have to take a, take a back seat with our product. So you, I, I, that, that was my concern. I mean, you said it differently than his boss has said, there'll be less negotiation room. Well, <laughs> you know, I, I'm a little more direct with him, but, but I can't, and it, it's great that you focus on this because that's why he is meeting so regularly uh, with L. And if it comes to a point where the performance isn't there, we have out clauses. That's never been an issue uh, thus far. We have started talking to a third party firm. And the only reason we've started talking to a third party firm is they are also partners with several other state associations. They already know our product. They're partners with the National Federation now. It's a little bit advantageous for us to talk about them. Then the board can decide, do you want us to see even other people? Well, we've had those initial conversations because we can't let this captive opportunity, not only to pin up advertising, but people are going to be so excited about play 
Well, it's going to be a selling point. I mean, there's going to be so many people wanting to watch it. You're going to have the pixel art sides of it. There's just so many other things that you're going to be able to sell to a potential advertiser that that's going to have value. And we just don't need to miss that opportunity because of, they don't just fall in your lap too often. So that, we need to get paid back for what COVID's done to us. Is that duly noted for your next report? Yes, correct. <laughs> there you might be. Thank you. Uh, and uh, Daryl and, and Marlon, that's that, and, and the reason we have some non-school members on our board is to remind us of things like that. It's easy for us to get pigeonholed into all the issues surrounding principals and superintendents and forget the other stuff. Um, we do have an action item in 5.6 that I would ask uh, that you look at, uh, and that is some personnel manual changes. Here, the bottom line is uh, we have negotiated a contract uh, opportunity with the Kentucky Education Development Corp, which I believe is our largest cooperative uh, in, of the eight uh, uh, cooperatives. And they have agreed to take on the employees of the association on a memorandum of agreement, which will be significant savings to the association. There will be a fee to that. They will become a $50,000 sponsor for our association. In other words, they'll get that much in terms of advertising and the digital things, and that's what they want that. Uh, in exchange, they're going to give us a, a uh, they'll give us a contract where they will take care of our employees. It will make some changes in some of our personnel uh, policies, and I don't mind telling you. Uh, and Mr. Mitchell has been in on the details of this. The most negatively impacted in this is talking to you right now, uh, because the changes in leave, the changes in accumulation of leave, are going to affect us. The longer you've been there, the more impact it has but it is the best for the association's financial future uh, to do that. So um, it, it's with a little bit of trepidation, as she can tell you, uh, that, that we will, we are, if you approve the contract, we are, to, we are moving our entire staff to basically have payroll handled through KEDC. Once you approve that, they go back to their board. They've already given a preliminary approval. They've got to go back to their board for a final vote. Uh, and our support staff or our, our classified staff that we discussed with you uh, several months ago, they, they actually started with KEDC July the 1st. Uh, it's an opportunity for us to untangle a couple of webs and, uh, and really help stabilize some planning for the future and does not impact uh, comp salary, but it does impact benefits. And I've talked to a lot of you about those one-on-one. -on -one. So we would ask you to, uh, in the work in the full meeting, to approve the commissioner engaging in MOA with KEDC for processing payroll. It would revise our policies, policies that are in conflict. Uh, and uh, there's no more accumulation of our existing programs. We would, some of our people that have some time built up, et cetera, they would still be able to use it. They wouldn't be able to accumulate anymore. And we can handle that through our contract. And our policies would, would need to be amended. The other thing that I will tell you included in this recommendation, I do not want to hide anything with our financial situation. Um, K, uh, our KHSA policies would be amended to include references to a reduction in force. Depending upon what goes on with COVID, we may have to eliminate positions, period. And that is the most, uh, obviously the most uncomfortable thing you have to go through locally. Uh, but, but we have certain services that probably would be months needing to be provided. Uh, but even work in force or reduction in force stuff, as you all saw in the communication that Chad gave you, um, when you look at that, um, there's other options. You've got furloughs, you've got layoffs. We're not to that point on July the 10th. But how the future goes could dictate that. So that is included in the recommendation is that you go ahead and authorize that. And again, per the regulation, you all hire me and I'm responsible for the other things. But I, I don't want anybody being unaware. Staff's well aware that it's a possibility. Um, we do not. And Chad, do you mind spending just a second, Chad, on the fact that really with our size and RIF policy, even FMLA is not applicable, but it's better if we do it. Right. We've all learned that with some of the new legislation and emergency uh, action that's been taken by uh, the executive branch at the national level and the legislature or the Congress, we've uh, had some additions in terms of different programs that match up 
with the FMLA um, that are that are kind of a little bit different. You know, at first when we saw some of the things that like the expanded family and medical leave act that was passed through, you know, the, through the uh, reaction to COVID as well as the paid sick leave. Some of those apply to us a little bit differently in the past. Initially, you know, my hopes with that, it would still be just like FMLA. We're, we don't have 50 employees, so it's not going to apply to us. Well, when it comes to those very narrow things, um, we are going to, we are going to have some obligations under that if we're impacted, but that's if we're impacted. Um, you know, as you can see, our staff is very proactive at uh, um, utilizing our, our masks and uh, I think Ms. Mitchell's had to uh, quadruple the uh, hand sanitizer budget. And I know Roy has been uh, d dogging it pretty good in our office about keeping the stock. So, uh, hopefully we won't find ourselves impacted by that, but we might have some loved ones that might have to be cared for. But generally speaking, uh, when it comes to FMLA, that's not a problem. So when we look at our reduction in force uh, type of things, we're going to, you know, looking at some of the documents that are included in your agenda, you know, we're going to look at all those things. That's something that Commissioner it's been re reviewing and, and talking with me as well as other people and trying to make sure we're prepared to you know face the challenges that come ahead hoping uh, that that we don't really have any that, that we're on the path uh, to recovery that we're on the path to resumption but we have to plan because that's that's uh, Commissioner Tackett's job and, and he's saddled us with with those responsibilities as well, as well and we welcome them. The, the only other thing I would add, especially for the new board members, is to remember that uh, if I were ever asked advice, I would tell people that don't undervalue the number two job. The number two job is the best job in the Army. My uncle used to tell me he was a career military guy because the number one job is none but headaches. And the reason I say that, too, is this whole type of discussion uh, when you get into making this, unfortunately, the number one duty of the commissioner of the KHSA is not in the Constitution. It's not in your board policies. But our number, my number one job and whoever's in this job, number one job is to make sure we're open tomorrow. And that may mean that all things aren't comfortable. And I know that we have had discussions about this all summer. We are very hopeful. We don't want to lose anybody. We don't want to lose anything we're doing. But... We also have to know that, that we we may have to turn on that same dime that Larry Coldiron had to turn on at, at his school when they said, okay, three days from now, you got to be ready for a month or so of NTI. And after the old heck moments, they had to do it. We may have that same turn. And so we, I always say when, when I listen to the staff as they prepare for their staff meeting or their state events and they go through the checklist, there's always those things we talk about that we say, now that we've talked about them, they won't happen. Let's hope this is one of those, but we are prepared if we need to. But the motion will be simply to approve that contract with any of the policy changes. Let me get real quickly to the last one uh, on finances. And really, this is more of a report. We would ask you to, uh, when we take it to the full board, we'll just do an acceptor report. Um, officers of the board and others asked me to update a copy. For those that remember, in the May meeting normally, we will share with you what we call our internal planning document or our working budget. And you get to really drill down into some of the events, et cetera. We would ask you to become familiar with that before we have to have further discussions on an item like that. Uh, that's not uh, every month you get the standard board reports, which look just like the school district reports on general ledger and income statements. But this is this drills down to the events. So that document is in there. It's just a report then each meeting you will be given, uh, the new board members, you will be given a cash disbursement journal, a general ledger and an income statement report. And that is your opportunity uh, to scrutinize, question anything uh, that, that you have. Uh, we've, had we've had board members board before that have sat there and run through 10 pages with most of notes on it. And we've had others that haven't asked a question in their, in their eight years. Either way is fine with us. We also did right at the end of the fiscal year, right at the end of June, we were able to settle with the University of Kentucky on our football championship and with Rupp Arena on our basketball championship. Let me share with you just a little bit that you'll find in the detail on the basketball tournament. Obviously, we, we didn't get – only June 30th that we received our funds, so we'll, we, we know we're late on one thing. We know we have not yet sent whatever little bit of expense uh, money is going to our participating teams. And we may come to you next meeting with – a motion about expenses for this coming year, but we'll we'll discuss that then. Um, 
but for last year's tournament, we had not paid uh, those expenses. And we hadn't paid them in football either because, again, we had, didn't have our settlement. And they shut down. A lot of their operations people shut down the same time we did. So it was uh, it was good. Their people are fantastic to work with at both Rupp and, uh, and uh, the football stadium at UK, the operations people. I'll tell you that the Rupp Arena people, if you've read any of the things, if you haven't, I'll send you the article. They've had significant layoffs. At the, at the Civic Center, there's less than, there's not even double figures in people working at uh, at, Lex, at the Rep Arena right now. There are a lot of them are furloughed effective, I believe effective either July 1 or August 1. They had another big round of furloughs because they can't book events because re events are restricted. We are one of the people offering to help and have tried to give them a little help early in getting their return to events document uh, that they've got to submit. Uh, it's an indoor venue with reserve seating. They're going to have, they've got a hurdle to, to clear, but um, we're, we're helpful because it involves so much of us that we're <laughs> helpful that our offer to help will, will get involved as well. But our basketball tournament, the girls tournament in a day and a half yielded a little over a hundred thousand dollars in ticket revenue. We still have outstanding money from um, at least one girls program, program and several, several boys who, who sold, sold tickets, tickets to the tournament. To the tournament that they qualified, they sold tickets, they still have the money, and they, they had, they had they until August, I believe, they have until August to, to offer refunds. And then whatever's left comes to us because it was bought. It's already been bought. It's not found money. It belongs to the association. So uh, we still got a few we got to follow up with. One of our boys' schools sold, start selling the day they got their packet, and they sold a bundle. And Reed might even know who that school is. There, there's a, there was some excitement uh, in there. So we, we may have still just a little bit. We did ask uh, as part of the cancellation of the tournament, the eventual cancellation of the tournament, that if you didn't want your money back as a ticket holder, you could donate that. We did receive about $55,000 in total donations from people. Now, let me preface that. Some of that was the Sweet 16 Club who took a refund on their tickets but left, let us keep their donation. We will get from Rupp when they get back up to full staff, and I think they're going to get this to me by the end of July. We will get a list of donors and be able to send thank you notes out so people can have it for their taxes, all that good stuff. So we'll, we'll take care of that for people. So financially, we're okay right now. We're not in danger of shutting down next week. We, you know, we are very hopeful financially. Let me say it this way. We're very hopeful financially that fall events are held. We will not make recommendations to you on the fall based on money. It will be on safety first and foremost. I don't want anybody thinking that we would make a decision that somehow because somebody needed the money. Once we get through this fall, we'll have a better idea if we need to go to either the legislature or other grant programs, et cetera. We've already planted a seed with some of the federal opportunities We've planted a seed with the Department of Ed and with the with the folks in Frankfurt about potentially seeing what's available there. We were able to get some PPP money through the First CARES Act. We are very thankful for our current uh, daily banking relationship. Um, as I understand it, uh, and they're a large multi-state bank, we were the second customer approved. They knew we were hurt by the cancellation of the basketball tournament. So thankfully, Senator McConnell's office also helped shepherd that uh, state government helped shepherd that and the, and the bank so we were blessed and at this point we will take we were we're getting advice from our audit firm on whether we exercise the eight or 24 week option and it's going to be just looking their books uh, as mr billings knows from the private sector and i know you know people that are involved in this daryl we'll have to take we have to look at certain parameters for those that, that might not have been in on some discussion we had during orientation um, there's certain parameters to that where you have to spend a certain portion of your of the PPP money on payroll in a certain time or it becomes a loan versus a grant. And the second revision to that, which was an H.R. 7010, uh, extended that period from eight weeks to 24 weeks. But the catch is that whichever one of those you use, that's how long you have to wait if you're if you're going to make any adjustment in your full time equivalency payroll. So part of it was we all know. Can we get money flowing back in the economy? And we're, we're all seeing that. So that's just information uh, going forward. And all we would need in all of that over detailed bit of information is just an acceptance of the report. I have one question. Were, were we able to 
receive any kind of concession from Lexington Center and Rupp Arena for any concession at all from, from not hosting the tournament, from not having their tournament? We were able, on the girls' side that we hosted, they cut about everything out of their bill. Their bill went from a little over, which would have been about a break-even event, to where they reduced their rental and expenses to about half of what it would, would have been. The girls on the girls' tournament. What, did they do anything at all on the boys' tournament? They did not. Normally, our contract calls for them to get a fixed amount of our novelty fee, for example. That's $12,000. And fixed guarantees regarding hospitality and stuff. None of that was, was imposed from the contract. So they, they felt like they didn't spend any. They didn't, they didn't need any. So there was a lot of concessions. We we negotiated, best of my estimate, uh, Mr. Billings, it's probably about $75,000 that they saved us uh, just through a lot. Of, and a lot of that is discussion, and a lot of that was their initiative. The other piece is they took over all our ticket management this year and did all the boys, including all the refunds. And I'm not sure we've seen a bill yet. And that was a that was a, a nice amount. So they they are a partner to us. Reminder to the new board: we are contracted for our boys' tournament there through 28, and we are contracted the girls for 23. Actually, had a pending item on our agenda for May that we have not yet considered that would marry those two dates up. We would be at both both venues till 28. Is it? it? Yes, sir. I'm way too long. So, so we just move those items or do we, all right, we just accept those items and we're moving forward to our regular meeting. Next item, 5.8, retirement of Bonnie Barnes. I believe Ms. Barnes has an announcement that she wants to make sure that all our listeners and everybody know, and uh, we're celebrating with you, ma'am. You, you can, or we'll spill the beans. Um, I will be retiring um, as of September 1, uh, after 31 years uh, in education, and that means that I will be retiring from the board. Um, wow, and I really don't like seeing that in writing. That conflicts me. <laughs> <laughs> um, because I, I really miss this group. So thank you, Mr. Garrison, for agreeing to... Um, to step in, I, I do appreciate that. And you will enjoy this crew and have a good time. Who knows, maybe I will get back one of these days. We thank you publicly for your three yes. decades in public education. We certainly do. Started when you were five. <laughs> and still married to an old man. This item, <laughs> this item does have an action piece to it. A reminder that when a board member retires or leaves, in their last year of service, then the Board of Control replaces that member, uh, feeling like there's not time enough to have an election, et cetera. So the recommended motion on this item is to approve the appointment of Superintendent Alvin Garrison of Covington Independent Schools to complete the final year. Then Mr. Garrison and others may make the decision if they want to run for another term uh, when that time comes up in January. So we just move that motion to? Yeah, that motion would go to your regular meeting. So we'll move that motion to our regular meeting. Next item on the agenda is 5.9 adoption of 2020-21 meeting schedule. Sent to you all a couple of, I don't know, a couple of days ago. It's, it's a blur right now. Um, the We looked and, and gave you some meeting dates. We've had no feedback that any of these dates look bad right now. Um, I know that our September meeting normally connects with the annual meeting, which we're not having uh, except for virtual. Um, I think that those dates were in that email. Uh, J September 16th would be the next regular scheduled meeting. And then they go to uh, the November, January, uh, February, and May dates. So those are in that agenda item. I know that like everything else with COVID, we need to consider this as uh, tentative dates. But I think the, the motion that we would ask or the recommendation that we would ask is that you accept, uh, adopt the tentative meeting schedule for 2021 with the meetings held in a manner consistent with public health guidance and the direction of the president, president elect. Uh, in other words, if you decide September meeting needs to be virtual, if you decide that 
we want to spread out. I hope we all evaluate this because to meet the social distancing guideline with this many people is a little bit of a challenge. But you all need to decide how we're going to do this and what we're going to do. Um, but also included in that, Mr. Miller, is uh, that I would work with our officers and with all of our board members on trying to establish a date for a special meeting prior to August 2nd. Okay. Now, I put prior to August 2nd, it's related to the fall season motion. Likely it will be that last full week of July. Okay. Any comments or questions about the meeting schedule? All right. If not, then we'll move that recommended motion. Got something. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. The last full week of July is the state KASA conference mm -hmm. that begins on Wednesday of that week. So I just, if, if there would be any way that we could meet Monday or. Initial, initial thoughts are to try to do Tuesday of that week because of KASA. Okay. And maybe to give Monday to polish a couple of things up before we present it to you all. That's the initial thoughts. But again, we want to see everybody else's availability. Some of you have district retreats before that, uh, et cetera. I would anticipate that's probably, what do you think, Mr. Billings? Three hours, we'd want to block two or three hours. Three. Yeah, uh, would, would, so, you know, that may not gel well with the full meeting up there, but we also know that those same people that want to know right now what they're doing, if we wait till after, if we wait till Saturday before Monday, your phones won't stop ringing. So we want to try to balance all of that. That works for everybody. So what we'll probably do is send out a doodle poll or something to you all that looks at here's options when are you available. Okay. And I know Mr. Billings wants to try to do it at a time when the the vast majority of you are available. We need as many people as possible on that discussion. Anything else? All right. If not, we'll move that motion forward to our regular meeting. Next item, 6.1, RPI discussion alternatives for 2020-21 only. Um, as we've looked at this, you know, it seems like we wanted to adopt the RPI so we would never have to make any changes. In about every two meetings, we've had to talk about something. But obviously, COVID cancellations uh, are something that we're going to have to address. So as we've talked about this with different states and talked about it around the horn and different sidebar conversations, um, basically uh, looks like the, the best way to go forward for us. If games are canceled due to the pandemic or mandatory quarantines, we don't have a result recorded. No forfeit or forfeit fees will be applied. And that is consistent with what all the states are proposing to their boards. We don't want a situation where somebody makes a decision, for example, not to quarantine because they're worried about a contract fee in a, in a basketball or football contract. That's just probably not smart. So the proposal would be that we're going to just say, basically, we don't like to use the word no contest, but it'd be a no contest. However, for seeded games in districts that have voted to seed in some sports and or football, which all is seeded, we would count that in the manner we currently do for games that are required but can't be played. And that's a win and a loss for everybody. So basically your winning percentage just got a win and a loss. That's existing in everything except football. Uh, and be a win and a loss. And then we would adjust the RPI. If you were, those of you that were here in January or February, my, that's blurry. We made an adjustment to the RPI for out of state schools to try to go above the 25 factor that we add in to be equal to the average winning percentage in state. You're not penalized for going out of state play. All right. We would apply that factor to any COVID canceled game because in the only sport, we have at least six basketball districts that now are using the RPI as part of their tiebreaker. Plus we have the whole football third, fourth, and fifth round if we have those rounds all this year. So we need to address the RPI question early. So the recommendation is we just assign that same fixed factor so we don't have a COVID factor and a fixed factor you got to remember and something else makes it easy for people to understand. Any comments, questions? If not, we'll move that recommended motion to the regular board meeting. Commissioner, oh. uh, Commissioner we, we've had a couple of texts over the last hour or so regarding helmet situations with football and us going forward with football, I guess 
some of the reconditioning companies have, have been closed for eight or 10 weeks. They're not going to receive helmets till late August. How will that play into effect? Right now we're getting into team sports. How, will that, how are we going to be able to make that play into effect with some of these schools that might be looking at a forfeit situation because they don't have helmets? We've only looked at Riddell. We only talked to Riddell and Shutt. The Nobody's the end of August. The last deadline from Shutt was August 10th, and that's just a scheduled date. They've been ahead of schedule. They did shut down. We had a bunch of the reconditioning places shut down. That would have to factor into your discussions in July. We'll know more about where we are, who's behind. There are one of the beauties of not allowing them to put on a helmet right now is everybody doesn't have them. And it's just one of those we'll have more data then. We shut in Riddell, we've talked to. There are others, but not many. That should answer the questions then for most folks that had that question regarding their helmets. Yeah. And, and and there could, but the, the, let's just say this, and I'll I will I will <laughs> be as point blank. I know the the AD at one of the schools we talked about, whose coach wears a real floppy hat, is all concerned about what happens if a quarantine happens to an opponent, and they lose a game over it. This is COVID twenty. It's not COVID nineteen. That's going to happen. There may be a school that doesn't get their helmet back, but nobody's scheduled to get to not get their helmets back and still not have enough practice time to play the first week. They might have less. So, you know, I, I know that there, that discussion is out there. There may be – there. you know, we mentioned earlier, there may be a district soccer game on the seeded district deadline that the day before some team has to quarantine because their opponent was there and they found out they were exposed. COVID. We may not be able to fix everything. And I think that's a, that's a very real possibility. You know, we talked last night just informally about some of the other competitions like dance and cheer. And suddenly, you know, we have a regional competition. we got a winner. And right before the state, we get an outbreak uh, in a school. COVID. We're going to – health's going to be first unless you all decide differently at your later meetings. Does that help you? You know, I think it would help the schools that had the questions. I yeah. think I think they'll be able to. No, that's good. We want to give you the information. And, and to be honest with you, that's why the sports interpreters exist in our office. Uh, if, if you might, you know, it certainly is a policy consideration, but specifics, reach out on the soccer to Chad and on volleyball to, to Butch and, and football, I'll take care of those kind of things. Feel free to refer those. But if you need that service information, feel free and ask us. We'll do it either way. We're comfortable either way. Anything else? If not, we'll move that motion on. Next item, individual sports 7.1, consideration related to Harlan County in track and cross country. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask to introduce a little bit of this just to make sure the board's familiar with standard policy. See if Ms. Bridenbaugh has any comments, and I might put our new member from the 13th region on the spot to see if he has any comments. Um, as part of the enrollment adjustment that was necessary in track and cross country, Harlan County High School was allowed, because of their enrollment, to, to drop classes. Harlan County is in the 13th region and asked us on a number of occasions to stay in the 13th region and was able to host the 13th region tournament a couple of years ago in basketball. So when they got to drop down, they're automatically, per your directive in the past, they're automatically placed with the other 13th region schools. Once they got that information, they have since requested that they be put in a different region, which does not necessarily contain 13th region schools. And that's for you all to consider. We do not have a recommendation on that because you've already exercised our recommendation uh, in January when you put them where they geographically belong. Uh, for the new members, there's been a lot of effort the last 10 to 12 years to put schools in the same quote unquote basketball region in all sports. The ADs groups are in those sports. There's lots of, you know, if I'm going to be in Region 6 for this, I'm going to try to be in 6 as much as I can because that way when they meet, they talk about it. Same thing for 4, same thing for 3. So the board kind of adopted a, a philosophy that we're going to try to keep everybody in their region. Discount, I shouldn't have even used 6. Discount 6 and 7, the metropolitan area of Louisville is just different. But the rest of the state, you've tried to keep them consistent. And that's what we use as a guide so that we don't get drug into personal desires. The other thing you'll always have to do with an enrollment or with an alignment request is figure out 
who they're competing against. That may not be the case here. But in some cases, they'll, they'll tell you, I really need to go up here because it's two miles closer. And you start looking, and there may be other reasons why they prefer to go to that other district or other regions that have nothing to do with geography. So given that, Sarah, do you have anything to add with regard? I mean, you received the written request and told DAD you, we would present it, but. Absolutely. And you can see the letter that he sent to me. Um, I've made it, uh, Commissioner, attached it there for you. Um, and I'm just passing on uh, that letter and his request. Yeah, though, and this, this also is why this board will be interesting for some of the new ones and your sports knowledge around the state, you, you'll we'll, we'll definitely, if it's not already perfect, it'll get better. And you start looking at who's in a region and where somebody wants to go in that sport and who somebody's in another region and where they want to go, you kind of may be able to figure out what the motivation is. I'll leave it up to, to others to decide if that's the motivation here. But, uh, you know, I think the key for us, what we can't do is make a decision. For example, it might be easy to make a decision that uh, a geographically isolated school uh, should be in a certain region because we need somebody to host the regional. But that defeats the fundamental principles that you all have adopted. So that's where you all get to earn your uh, fee, which will be doubled this year. The board fee is doubled from zero to two times zero. Uh, but it'll be a chance for you to figure that out. Mr. Thompson, I don't know if, if you have anything to say or thoughts. Uh, I'd give my word that I would speak up for Harlan County and their, their points of reasoning for the request uh, when the board takes this under consideration. The first being travel distance. Um, they are um, located um, away from everyone else in Region 7 in their request, excuse me, in Region five and a request to go to region seven to stay in Eastern Kentucky. Um, the second point would be to balance the regions. There are um, 15 teams with Harlan County in region five and there is 10 teams in region seven. However, this does affect regions 12 and regions uh, 15 as, as well um, because they've been placed uh, based on their basketball regions placed in these regions of the track. And the last point being their ability to host Harlan County does have uh, phenomenal facilities and they would be putting in an application to host uh, the region uh, seven if allowed so by the board. And, and I think that uh, uh, as, I've, as I've listened to the, the discussion from others, the fact they can host is a double-edged sword because it's very good facility-wise. If any of you have seen their facility, it's a Taj Mahal, but they're without question geographically isolated. They're in a different spot uh, from a lot of the other people. But he made a great point, and I'm glad he did, that the schools that are geographically in basketball region 12 and 15, you're making a commitment at least once to go the other way to them because they have that kind of facilities. It's not like they're over here, but they have terrible facilities they would never host. So I, all of those issues come into play. It's great points from Mr. Thompson. We have, uh, they are a fairly new school, 2012, 13, somewhere in there. Um, we've tried to accommodate uh, their merger uh, in the old coal area, obviously created a large school from a, a huge, uh, I would say this, those of you, and I think we may have a board member from Harlan County, but if you know the county, they're geographically spread out. And if they never leave Harlan County, it's a huge county. And but they have uh, they've made requests before, and a lot of times it's been out. Uh, we want to be with the 13th. Uh, some of you familiar with 13th know that 13th didn't really want them in there because they didn't want to have to go there for the basketball region. But, but you know they were they were allowed to go there. And I don't know if Ms. Thompson, Mr. Slager, if anybody else has any other thoughts. But it, their their request is to move, and the the staff recommendation is silent because we think you've already acted on it. You acted on it in January. Do we have a graph of the, do we have a breakdown of what region seven is going to look like with them added or can we have that by it, it's on our website oh it is yeah okay. we can show you it's, it's the alignment for track and cross country i'm just curious how it would affect the other school those other member schools at the farthest one from them how will they travel to harlem i did look that up and um what i'm seeing is lawrence county would probably be the furthest school from harlem county uh, 140 miles, two hours and 43 minutes from Lawrence County to Harlan. However, on the flip side of that, Harlan County to Mercer County, 145 miles, two hours, 50 minutes. Yeah. 
And, and uh, it's one of those areas, and Mr. Eddie Saylor, when he was on the board, was a very good person at educating this. We used to take maps and put dots. And don't get confused that the dots that are closer together take less travel time. There, there is significant geographic road challenges in our state. Uh, you could probably go further in quicker time than you could make the trip uh, from Lawrence County to Harlan County. There's, there's all of those. Every region has those. I'm not picking on anybody. Every region has those. We go through this all the time. But this is, this is also a change in class, too, not just a change in region. No, they've already been approved. To, they were one of the ones that could drop down because of the decline in enrollment. They've already been approved to two, and we were directed to put them in the geographic location where they belong, and we did. And they're asking to, to alter that. So do we need to make a motion? Just needs to be moved forward for if, a if you are, you can do it either way. It probably, probably moving it forward to make a vote. Have a yeah, vote. and then because uh, again, the, the you've already approved the action. If you move it forward, you can at least take a final action on it. All right. So do I need a motion to move it forward? Just move. It. No, you just. All right, we'll move that item seven point one for Harlan County to our full board, board meeting for for, for the consideration. Board. All right, sport activity yeah. items, 8.1, staff report, eSports, NFHS network. Um, the NFHS network has a contract with Play Versus that is currently in effect as of July the 10th. Um, has been continual issues for a great opportunity for students, the ultimate oxymoron. Uh, uh, Joe, as our primary contact, you have anything you want to add on the eSports piece? maybe the game offerings that we've had a little problem with lately. Yeah, you know, I, I think we had a, an eSports call during the NFHS summer meeting last week, and, and to say it was contentious would be a little bit of an understatement. Uh, not just in their new price structure they're offering, uh, which isn't very favorable for small programs, uh, but they're continuing to look to add games that maybe our membership will not support. Uh, they're, with all the it in the past. Now they're talking about a game like Overwatch, which based on what we've gone through with Fortnite, I seriously doubt our, our schools would support. Uh, they are looking into possibly adding uh, games more sport oriented, possibly a basketball game. Uh, but there's a lot of things above uh, my level that the NFHS network is going to be working out with play versus to try and get them in line. I'll tell you, there's a very real possibility that because of some actions that have been taken, there may have been a breach in contract and we may be having another vendor who will keep education based schools in mind when they pick games. I am not a gamer. I couldn't tell you what Overwatch was. Certainly don't know what Fortnite is, but some of you may know people that are. And uh, we certainly, uh, the, the number one objection has been to calling it, uh, for, to adopting any first person shooter game. Number one objection. Um, we, this meeting last year was spent on eSports. It seems like that's all we talked about. Um, but it is, our schools love it. Our kids love it. Joe mentioned the pricing model. Last year, if, uh, if somehow Logan County wanted to have an eSports team and only had five kids, those kids would, publicly at least, have paid $64 a kid for the one season and $64 a kid for the next season times six kids, let's say. Okay, so very reasonable. Now the standard pricing per school for the year is $2,000. It became a billing issue for them. And, and that is, uh, we are contending, and Chad may get some work out of this, um, a number of us are contending that is a breach of their original contract. It then goes back to the association has a contract with them for, I don't know, it's a buck a kid or something that is part of our, it's not much, not even a dollar. It's some kind of royalty off the, uh, off for us to help pay for people's time that are producing this, doing all the documents, et cetera. It is, we're not in a perfect place with that agreement. We wanted you to know our intent is to go forward. The challenge will be for any of you or any of our constituent groups, when you go to sign your team up for this year, you're going to see shooter games on the menu that you can sign up for. They are supposedly finishing the division of their website. They have created a club division and a scholastic division, and they're 
their rationale is they'll put under the club division some of the games that we have we have troubles with. But they're still exposing it to your kids and your coaches to sign up if they want to. And and it's a challenge. But we're still trying to work that out. So just an update for you. No action needed. Anything else, Joe, you think we need to do? Okay. Uh, 8.2 is UCA division changes. Um, just for the board, the new board members, we handed over the, the actual conduct of our cheerleading competitions three to four years ago to UCA, the Universal Cheerleading Association, the Division of Varsity Brands. They provide our judges. They provide the rules. They do basically everything. Well, they made a change this summer on rules. And Sarah, I don't know if you want to real quickly give them those division changes, but it really has to do with how many people can compete together. Yeah, they did make a change. Um, for those of you that don't know, we offer small, medium, large, and super large in the all-girl divisions, and that's where they've made that change. Um, what we did in this previous season, small went from five to 12 individuals competing, and they have extended that to five to 15, and then adjusted the rest of, the, of them accordingly. So um, it ended up adjusting the medium to be 16 to 19, large 20 to 23, and super large 24 to 30. Um, and for those of you, it, it didn't max them. We had 30 as a max before, so the max is still the same. It, and five is the minimum. It just shuffled in between there. And so what we're asking is, do you want our schools to follow those same uh, size categories? What, what she uh, uh, detailed to me, and I talked to uh, Butch and other cheerleading people too, we all are in agreement. What we don't need is our school having a routine developed for 12 people and also having to have one for 15 just because our divisions are different. So we're better off to just line up with their numbers, and I think that was Sarah's recommendation, and I'll put in here as, our, as my recommendation. Um, similar on the dance uh, division, um, we, we actually had basically your, your implied approval, which never took a formal vote in February, uh, and then COVID hit. We haven't talked about it. But we had very few people signing up for certain divisions of dance. Uh, matter of fact, one, if I'm not mistaken, Mike, you can correct me, but we have one school that by declaring in their division was state champion because uh, they were the only one. Yeah. So, yeah. And so – that's not the competition standard you all expect. So uh, our recommendation was to take those three dance styles and not have a separation of squad size. It has nothing to do with school enrollment. It has to do with size of your squads and just have a, like have a jazz, hip hop. Yeah, but the, the third dance, jazz, hip hop, pom. Thank you. Those are the three. And instead of having size divisions in there, we just have one of each. And then the fourth that, that you can detail a little bit, Mike, but we, they've, they've been asking us to consider adding a game day division. What we think we can do, we talked about it a lot in the before COVID break, uh, but we, we think we can have four styles, have two styles, thinking long-term on a state event, two styles in the morning, two styles in the afternoon, still stick to a, a maximum of 96 squads because that's about all a gym can hold. And it may be less with COVID, don't get me wrong, but – still have that competition. You want to talk to them a little bit about what game day is? Uh, game day is, is um, something that UDA has been pushing in their camps uh, per request of the schools about how you deal with a, a dance team that wants to do sideline performances at a football game or at a basketball game. Um, so think of it in a situation where it's not necessarily the dance that you would uh, picture at a uh, private dance or club uh, where they're going to put on a modern jazz performance, but more likely the squad that gets to perform at the actual game that day. Uh, okay. So our request would be, and I think uh, Mike and Sarah, we've all talked about this a number of times, that we just line up with UDA as far as that goes. They don't necessarily have size divisions either. Uh, and we would just have the three dance styles plus game day as ours for this coming year. And keep our fingers crossed that we get to have indoor events. So we'll just move it. We'll, anything else before? I will right, just take that recommended motion and move it to the regular board meeting. Next item, item nine, due process items. 9.1, transfers and eligibility appeals July the 1st, 2019 to June 30th, 2020. 
each meeting you will get a report that has a summary of eligibility cases reminding you that that data is subject to not subject to disclosure because it is private personal records in a lot of cases but you will get that all you will need to do is accept the report each meeting and that's what we're recommending today mr collins anything to emphasize i know he wouldn't resist the only thing I'd reiterate, as I mentioned earlier, we have started to move forward with our due process cases, you know, knowing that uh, the Supreme Court and other uh, state and local judiciary bodies had put a, a moratorium on having these type of due process events. Uh, we have moved forward, uh, but we are doing them through uh, Zoom uh, technology right now. We're one of the first state agencies that operate under KRS Chapter 13B that have have done that. Um, we learn a little bit more each time we conduct one. Uh, it went pretty well the first date. Our next uh, up, upcoming date is going to be the 14th of July, but uh, we're going to continue in that format uh, a, a, until we can reevaluate uh, what the current environment is under the uh, current restrictions from the Supreme Court as well as other judici judiciary authorities. All right, anything else? On that, all right, we're going to move the last item to our regular board meeting. So, with that being said, I think that's it for this meeting. We're going to we're going to adjourn, and then we're going to come back for our regular board meeting. The the question is logistical for you all, um, Butch. Are they close to ready for us? Okay, we we know we went a little long in the work session. Marlon gets the award. <laughs> <laughs> the question I'm for sure the board. I do. Do we want to go ahead before we stop our stream and announce a time and Joe could put it out on social and everything else? Do we want to give you time to go out there and eat? It's a box lunch. You want to go ahead and do that real quick? Or do you want to take 15 minutes to rearrange the agenda, do the board meeting and eat a cold sandwich? It's just sandwich box. Well, I personally don't want to eat in front of 2,700 people. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the bringing it back in here is probably not a good option. Julie, you're all's called. Do you have a preference? I think the chairs are looking for just your preference. <laughs> and Marilyn doesn't get a vote because she'd vote for lunch every day. It's twelve fifteen. We could we could take half an hour. You wanna do that? Uh, try to be back at twelve fifty, say. Can we do that? Is, is does anyone object to that? Or forty five minutes would be one o'clock. I mean, if ten minutes is gonna kill anybody. <laughs> And the lunches, Butch, you want to give us detail? And the atrium, the lobby area that is available if everybody wants to spread out. Does that work for you all? Mr. Miller, are you yeah, good? Come back at 12.50. Yeah, if yeah, we're good, then you need to adjourn us so Mr. All right, Ketcher we can, can do his We're adjourning this um, work session. God, what, almost four hours? Awesome.